Uh, in honor of this evening, I am wearing some garb that was handed down to me by a bard of North Keep uh, who passed away. Um, this was uh, made by Mistress Katrin Furchgwillem, who was a um, ardent participant in the bardic arts here in North Keep. Um, it's one of the reasons that she received her laurel. Uh, the other reason is for embroidery. Um, and when she passed away, she asked that her garb be distributed to members of the populace. And I was very honored to receive one of her pieces. So I am wearing this in honor and in memory of Mistress Katrin, who um, at, at her services, there was a, a good amount of bardic at her request. So um, we were very sorry to have, to have lost her. Um, so. Okay, so I invited every single uh, bard that I could think of. Um, some of you are very famous individuals, um, and some of you are even more famous. Um, I'm very honored at how many of you were able to make it. Um, and so, yeah, I, I am super excited about tonight. Um, bardic tradition in Onstiora, as near as I've been able to tell, just from reading the oldest um, newsletters I've been able to get my hands on, some of which go back to Principality days, bardic was hugely important in Onstiora. Um, it's one of the very first major arts and sciences that I can find documented where there was a bardic guild, there were bardic meetings. Um, it, it was um, very much a, a, a part of the early Onstiorian culture, from what I understand. Obviously, I was not there. However, um, two people that were there at the beginning have joined us. Um, and I am so happy to see you both. Um, if you would like to introduce yourself for those who do not have the pleasure of knowing you. Would you be willing to unmute and introduce yourselves? Sure. Uh, my name is Megan Andoniel of Glen Galen. I am a Viscountess in the Kingdom of Osteora. I am a lion. I am a bard. I was a bard before I came to Osteora, and I will be a, probably be a bard after I die. <laughs> It is so much in my blood. Mm. And um, I had the, the great honor of bringing what I learned from the Outlands where I was princess to Onsteora. And if you want to, to talk about that later, just ask. But um, Onsteora at that time was not singing. And I had learned some things from Elflid and Goomvault that I brought back to the kingdom. And for that, for a long, after that, for a long, long time, we were singing. Go ahead, Orm. I had Orm Sjolpide. I am um, a master of the laurel, uh, a lion of Anstiara, and, um, and a bard, Queen's bard. And uh, we, uh, you were correct, is we were, um, a very unifying type of, of arts and crafts type of thing. It, uh, this is it before the advent of distractions like cell phones in everyone's face during every part of every event. And so uh, if you wanted, um, if you wanted any entertainment, you had to make it yourself and Bards filled that um, requirement. Wonderful. So I think a lot of people connect the bardic tradition in Onstiura um, with our very earliest days, from what I understand. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Obviously, I wasn't there. What I know is just from what I've read, um, but that um, Her Majesty Willow was very insistent that there be a bardic guild in Onstiura and that bardic performances be part of events in a very formal way. 
Um, is that is that the case? It wasn't exactly a guild. What she did was she established, and as any queen should do such things, she said, I want bards in my kingdom. And I am establishing the order of the queen's bards. Now, this is not to be taken as a society level order or even a local order. It was her personal thing. And she said, "My, you know, as, as Queen Willow of Onstaora, I would like to see bard craft developed and, and flower in our kingdom and like to praise bards that um, come forth to, to entertain our kingdom and to, to also enshrine in words uh, or poetry or whatever, the deeds of the people of Onsteora. And to that, oh, I'll go get a, an example of our belts. Um, but to that end, she established the Queen's Bards of Onsteora and it was her person for her reign. And then she did this again in her second reign. And um, it was very much affected the kingdom. Unfortunately, some people didn't understand, well, they weren't, honestly, were not really rooted in, in medieval understanding, but they didn't understand that this was a very queenly thing to do. And so there was a little tiny bit of personality thing went on around it, but mostly it really brought Onsteora to thrive in that area. And everyone who was a Queen's Bard was encouraged not to compete, but to support each other in being the bard that they were before people and, and we helped each other. Stacia was a stellar example of that. I think Orm and I were among the very first bards and Stacia followed right after. And she would help anybody anytime in their bard craft to put them before somebody and say, what can you say to these people? What do you know of our history? What do you know of the lore? How can you spread this? How can you um, share this? And she was a really special force in this in this way. And um, I'll step aside here and let Orm talk if you have anything to say on that. <laughs> and go get an example of our belts. Um, Willow's, Willow's concept of uh, bardcraft uh, was drawn extensively from written accounts in history, um, Irish law about bards uh, figured into that, uh, but that wasn't the you know sole extent of it. It 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 went all the way up until even the the early Renaissance. Uh, how how bard craft morphed was important to her because she was trying to be as inclusive as possible and still reach the same kind of goal. The, and that goal was um, to unify and promote individuals um, in an area within your shire or your barony or your or the kingdom. And um, they they were somewhat in reserve and on call to the queen. She, um, she one night she and uh, um, uh, Jonathan were, were sitting uh, under the moon and I strolled by and she summoned us over, summoned me over and said, we're enjoying the, the, the evening and the moon shines bright. Give us a story. And so, um, who will deny so I, their queen <laughs> such a thing? <laughs> so, so I, I gave, uh, a rendition of a poem I wrote about about the night was death, the moon was high. And, and that I believe was, oh. that I believe is what led to uh, me just being included in being, uh, being a bard. But it was one of those deals where it's on, it's kind, it was kind of on demand and it wasn't for everybody be quiet. I'm gonna perform now. It was, it was a command type performance attitude. You came in, you owned the group for the purpose of getting something across, unification, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And that's something else that's worth talking about. If you care to come back to it, Zubeda was taking the floor because it was very different then than it was now, than it is now. Well, um, 
actually the one and only time I have ever competed in a Bardic competition, that was the requirement. The Bardic, uh, Good. The, Good. The, the Bards had to perform in the middle of feast. And if they couldn't command the attention of the people around them, then they did not succeed in the competition. I love uh, it. And, love and it. It, was, uh, it was at uh, a relatively small group up here in the north called Chamonix. And, and that was yeah. that was the requirement for their bards is they had to perform at multiple tables throughout the feast uh, and and command attention. I love it. I love um, it. I wanted to ask, just kind of opening up to the entire floor, what got you into Bardic? What drew you to Bardic um, in in SCA? Would anyone like to jump in? I vote. Um. I got, I got cajoled into it. Uh, at my first Bardic circle, I, I, without even really understanding what I was getting into, I, I kind of ad hoc a story I'd heard ages before, and I think there were four people there, and and I didn't think anything of it. it was, I was eighteen, a, a motormouth moron who was enjoying the company of total strangers so i didn't have any real perspective i was getting into um the following year was my first guardian i had i had joined the sca just after moonshadow's guardian i started playing in moonshadow and i wanted to attend i wanted to see the competition while i was walking there um master ulf wound up in this cluster of people as we were siphoning across the bridge across the site we were on and he looked at me and he said ivo are you going to compete and i looked at him and i'm like what are you talking about i'm here to watch and he looks at me and puts the what i now know to be a very typical ulfish smile on his face he goes yeah i know what you're talking what i'm talking about are you going to compete i said it wasn't on my list of things to do and the next thing i felt is this very bony elbow jab me in the ribs and he goes wrong answer <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I, I'm not apt to argue, not on that one. So I, I showed up and I did my first real competition Bardic, which up until that point, I, I don't even think I did that much Bardic at all. I just occasionally hung out and sang with a group, if that. Um, and it was do two, and then, you know, I just figured I'd do two pieces and get eliminated. I did uh, two pieces. And then the judges came out and said, okay, here are the finalists. And I was two out of the three finalists. And I'm like, what? Um, so I made the finals on my first Bardic. Did not win, thank God. And that that's how I got started. Um, Ulf recognized a natural talent and nudged me into it. And he predicted I would get addicted to it. And I did. He was spot on on that. And that's how I got into Bardic. And my emphasis was always storytelling. And my preference within that was always historical stories. Wonderful. Thank you. Robin? Okay. Uh, I kind of fell into Bardic, actually. Uh, <laughs> hold on. Does someone else want to say something before I start? Or I heard voices. She said, Robin. We both responded. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Oh, which Robin were you referring to? Does which, it matter? Go ahead. Whichever one was willing to speak. Okay. Well, I figured I'd I get one of them. <laughs> okay. Well, I kind of just fell into Bardic. I started doing it at my second event ever, which was Candlemas, coincidentally. And it kind of gave me a reason to stay in the SEA because at that point, all I knew was basically fighting, service, and that was it. And it's like, okay, um, well, I don't want to get hit with sticks every week and I can wash dishes at home. So what is there for me here? So they said, oh, we're having a bardic competition. I'm like, a what competition? A bardic competition is basically you perform doing something. And I'm like, oh, and it was just, I was, and I was basically gestured by the Baron and Baroness to, hey, would you like to do it? Now I come from this performance and musical tradition to um, where I don't perform unless I am absolutely ready, unless I have rehearsed, unless I know what I'm doing. So me going up there for the first time and doing something was just 
I basically broke a personal moral rule of my own. It's like, oh, I cannot believe I actually went up here and did something totally unprepared and totally unready. And the only thing I had prepared to do at the time was uh, Scottish sword dancing. So at my very first Bardic event, I did this Scottish sword dance without any music because again, I was really unprepared. But I remember that there was a young lady who sang very, very beautifully, and she wound up won winning the championship that year. So I decided, okay, I cannot put forth a crappy performance like this ever, ever again. I know better than this. My band director would kill me if I ever put on a performance like this. So I went back and I worked up three flute pieces. And I didn't make finals. So I went and asked him, like, well, wait a minute. Why in the world did I not make finals? And it's like, well, everything you did, everything good. Everything went well. But at the last event, you sang, you danced, you did a lot of different things. And their excellencies were looking for that this time. And I'm like, oh, OK. <laughs> so that's how I worked up the whole Robin Carrot performance, where I have to sing, tell a story, and dance and play a musical instrument all in the same performance <laughs> in order because that's what I thought I had to do as a as a as as just me, not just as a bard, just as me. I have to put forth all this effort just to get up there. And apparently it worked. Because at the first performance where I did a full performance as Robin Carrot, I got recognized and I kept doing it. And I got to do my first I step it. Uh, where I inadvertently flashed my crotch to the kid queen, and I did not realize I was doing that. But it got me on the map, and it got me known, and it got me my first, <laughs> oh, <laughs> and it got me my first competition, uh, my first competition, and it won me my first championship. Because by the because by the second time I got to my championship, it was Candlemas. It was the same event where I did a horrible, horrible performance, but I came back. I was ready. I had a solid performance. I sang, I danced. I think I played a musical instrument. I probably didn't, but I did sing and I did tell a story. And all it came down to was that one performance and I cannot remember her name. I know Rosa knows her name because we talk about her all the time, but she was feeling down at one event and I went and told her, don't feel down. Do you know I have to do four different things in my performances in order to be equal to your singing? I have to do four different things to be equal to your singing. But that is how I got into Bardic. Thank you, Sydney. Thank you, Sydney. <laughs> With Sydney, though, there were two or three who were bards. Um, um, it's okay. I don't know Sydney's last name, last persona name, but she is this excellent operatic singer. And okay. I'm like, okay, so I'm going to have to do like four different things to equal her one thing. And that's pretty much how I performed for the most part. So that is how I got into Bardic because I didn't want to get hit with sticks. Well, Robin, I'd like to get to know you better. I am sorry that I have never made your acquaintance because um, I am a, too a Scottish dancer. I am actually a teacher and I still retain my seat on the Scottish official board of Highland Dancing. And um, I, I, I love what you, you, I love your story. Your story is Bardcraft. <laughs> And so thank you so much. Oh, thank you. And I'm sorry I haven't gotten a chance to meet you either. And um, I don't happen. want to, yeah, and I don't want to insult you with my Scottish sword dancing. I didn't get that far, but if you would like to see it, I will be more than happy to the perform it. The fact that you <laughs> cared to try was awesome. And I love your story, which to me is Bardcraft. Wonderful. Would I anyone promise else you that what Robin does mm -hmm. is entertainment and is Bardcraft. His number one absolute greatest asset is utter commitment to what he's doing. That is absolutely fully Robin Carrot right up there wanting to entertain you, wanting to see you smile, and giving anything he could possibly give to make it happen. Thank you. <laughs> So the Love thing it. about Robin is that he's he's not telling the full story. Can't hear you. Could you speak up just a little bit, Fionn? Sorry, you don't hear that very well. Further away. The, Robin's not telling his full story, though. The truth of the matter is, he was a performer his first day in the SCA. 
He showed up at a Bjornsborg event his very first day and asked how he could be involved and started as a herald on the field day one, entertaining the crowd with his own special style and exuberance. And that, I think, for everybody involved, was his first performance. And it was extraordinary for everybody that watched it. Thank you again. Thank you. <laughs> Where do you live, Robin? I am out of Bjornsburg now. Orm was one of the founders of Bjornsburg. Oh, okay. And our dearest friends on the planet are there. <laughs> so we have some folks here that do um, a different classification of Bardcraft because a lot of people assume that Bardcraft is either singing or storytelling. Mm -hmm. But we have people who uh, do instrumental music, and we have folks who perform in non-English languages. And I think that when you can pull someone into a performance without using words that they understand, or even words at all, that's its own unique form of bardcraft that's also very special. Um, Mistress Rianne, and I'm so glad that you could be here. Mm -hmm. um, a big part of my definition of am I at an SCA event is are the M Merry Musicians of Moonshadow playing music. It's, it's just been an integral part of my SCA experience from the first event I went to. So I wanted to say thank you, uh, given this opportunity to, to thank you for leading them for all of these years and making it a part of even our pandemic experience. Um, I don't know if you guys got to participate in the Moonshadow event, but they actually had a recording of the Merry Musicians of Moonshadow that if you scanned an OCR code on the box that was delivered to folks, you could listen to recorded music. And they also performed at Wies and Fears event. So um, yeah, they do was... very, they do awesome performances. If it wasn't for their work, uh, a lot of the stuff that we as musicians have done during the COVID pandemic would not have happened unless they submitted something for the Yule calendar or for the Maypole and were just willing to offer their stuff. So to that group and to Mistress Yannan, thank you very much for adding to the musical culture of our kingdom. Thank you, thank you. You know, I was thinking about your, uh, your question about uh, how I came to Bardic um, and and uh, it's actually a story about Duchess Willow. So in AS, perhaps, it usually is. Uh, AS, AS 24 or AS 25, uh, Duchess Willow, out of the kindness of her heart, came to the most northern group in Ansteora to moonshadow uh, a small shire event um, in order to perform her persona of being Duchess Willow. And so uh, she stayed up the entire night uh, as the dancing was going on in the feast hall. Um, I was wearing I was wearing loner garb at the time that was polyester, so it was stretchy. So it actually was kind of coming off of me during the dancing. And so at some point I had to retire to the side. Um, and uh, one of one of our members asked Duchess Willow. Um, he said, you know. I have heard you tell stories, Norse stories before, would you tell something? And so really just, she took a sip out of her cup and then stopped and told a long interwoven tale about Loki um, that was just delightful. And that really made the event for me, uh, listening to music in the background and uh, having, having lost my breath dancing on the floor and watching the other dancers go on. Um, nibbling at the the remains of what was left of feast on the table um, and drinking out of my goblet and listening to Duchess Willow tell tales. Um, and so I have to say that was my very first experience of the SCA at an event um, and it and it drew me in um, as Robin was saying, you know it showed a picture of what the SCA could be outside of the list field. Um, and I would also say, um, you know, I still, I, I am more of a teacher than anything else. I am more of, 
you know, in the Merry Musicians, I am the least, I am the least good of the players. Um, but I make sure that everyone has chairs. I make sure that the new people who come in are 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 taught their instruments, right? Uh, Megan and Orm came to Moonshadow and spent one day with us teaching us different songs. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, Ivo and Lilith learned those songs probably from me, but I am still repeating the songs uh, that Megan and Orm taught to Moonshadow um, had, what, a quarter of a century ago. That's and I didn't, to back, to back that's on, oh, I, was well, I didn't play I, I actually didn't play the harp. I actually didn't play the harp. Uh, when I first began, uh, and I so I actually, began, that's something so actually, that was given to me by the SEA. We're getting over top for some reason. Getting, over top for some reason. Elspeth, I think we're getting, Elspeth, I think we're getting, yeah, oh, well, I wanted to say something about Rihanna. Go ahead. Go ahead. She She's saying she learned these songs from um, Megan and Orm and pass them along. And some of the songs that she has, I have listed on my and do our music 101 for bards. I'm trying to pass it on to the next group of bards. So um, she should know that she's in she's in one of those lines of succession of passing on some of the great on our music. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And a lot of that music was captured, codified, published, and produced to the masses by Master Alden Drake, who created the Voices of the Star many years ago. Um, and we still get requests every once in a while for, you know, hey, does that exist? Where can we get a copy? Can it be downloaded? Uh, will there be more volumes? Things of that nature. That was a, a huge passion project of yours. Please, would you mind speaking to that, Master Alden? Sure. That Wow, that was a long time ago. <laughs> um, I had seen, I think, um, this was when I want to say Donya Antonia was premier bard um, sometime around that time frame uh, that I think it was the Kingdom of Eldermere had put together a songbook um, that was available for download on PDF. And, and I kind of took it upon myself to say, hey, why don't we as Ansteoran bards put one together? Um, and uh, my teacher, uh, Eleanor Fairchild, um, kind of one of the things she taught me was, you know, don't don't waste time, you know, asking for permission or for people to join you. Just go with it, and people who are passionate will join you. Um, mm -hmm. So so I just went forward with this project idea, um, and uh, I asked people to, you know, submit original pieces of either music, um, song, poetry, prose, uh, any vocal performance medium um, and I did ask for any song to either please have sheet music that we could include or a reference to what the bass tune was if it was a filk or something um, because one of the things that I saw an issue with uh, in in people's bards book bard books that would get passed on um, was there was all these great songs but no music to go with them uh, so when I when I produced voices of the star I really wanted to have music uh, to go with them that people could have access to. Uh, and people donated to that project uh, to help cover the cost because it, it was a hard print publishing. I went to a, a print shop and, you know, purchased every, all the materials to make sure that we had it. I got a, a master of the Laurel to do the cover art. Um, and there, there was a, a really cute thing in the cover art, kind of a, a an Easter egg, if, if you will. The, the border of the cover has uh, musical notation around. And I, I think what he told me was that it was the theme to I Love Lucy. <laughs> That's what was done around the cover. <laughs> uh, so that, that was pretty fun. Um, and I had started a volume two uh, many years ago, uh, again, asking for more contributions, uh, but I didn't get enough uh, to, to make publishing feasible. And, but I had, I had saved everything, and I believe I passed it all on to uh, Master Brian O'William. Uh, he, he was interested in picking that up again. I said, by all means, here's what I have. Run with it. And uh, we, we just haven't gotten a volume two uh, put out since then. Uh, 
but it was it was a very good project. That's a, yeah. it, was, it was a very good project. A Master Alden. Yeah. Yeah. That is um, uh, Tanak and Brian have uh, and I have all three of us have talked, and that is something that we are going to try to get into the works here pretty soon. So it, it is coming. It's it's getting everybody together with this stupid COVID thing. Yeah, it, it, it oh, takes a lot of effort. It, it, uh, I just had a question. Is there going to be an official call for that? Yes. Um, I had talked to Brian. Uh, it's been a few months ago, and I've spoken to Tanak because it that's something that's kind of passionate for me. I like having books with music notation and things like that. I find it easier for newcomers. Um, and so they were like, well, why don't we just do this? And I said, well, why don't we? Do we need to do something official? And they're like, no, let's just do it. So it's one of those things, it's, it's been in the works. And so it, but it, it is coming. It is a very big passion of mine. So um, and, and I, I'm happy to stay in the background and I'm happy to stay support, in the background and offer any sort of mentoring that y'all might want. Well, um, then let me just quickly say this I can help with uh, music notation if need be for that project. Okay. Because I was I was actually looking into doing something similar to that with another body of Ancioran works, and I took a look at it, and it's like, okay, this is going to be a bit of a a task for one person, so I just let it go. But it, since I know someone else, and there's a group of you doing that, if you need help with the music notation, please let me know. To Alden and um, to Robin and to Elspeth, I would make a request. It's very helpful to have the, um, the songs and, and the stories of any time in print, but could you please, as bards, take them forth, not in print, but do them yourself without a book. For the first 15 years in the SCA, we, had, we didn't have books, we memorized it. Um, I had a group called Megan Singers, and what happened was the, the kingdom was not uh, singing at that time. Lily was not singing, pardon me. And so I guess I lost the camera. Um, the, the kingdom was not singing at that time. And I had brought back all these songs that I knew from long before the SCA, as because I was a medieval, I had medieval interest before the SCA. And um, also things from the Outland and from Aitenbelt, which was our parent uh, kingdom. And I taught them one by one to people and then some other people brought other songs that I didn't know into the group. And I had what's called, what was called the Viscountess Megan Singers for eight years. And we practiced every Sunday in my living room for eight years. And at that time we began to take it out to the kingdom. And so it started with performances but then it went to fires and uh, firesides in little camps. And then it went to the fireside with the big fires, people, everybody gathering all around. And eventually people learned these. You didn't have to pass out, excuse me, a damn book. <laughs> it was oral tradition as the middle ages should be. Can I, and, can I uh, say something to that? Let me finish and then certainly please. But if you can't pass it through oral tradition, why bother with this? Why not just move on? So I want to speak on this because I feel very passionately about the subject. Um, yes, I do, I do I, too. <laughs> uh, Me too. I am just joining in. I, I am. So I see how the regalia I am the current kingdom bard. I really apologize for being late. This is meeting number four of the day in the third time zone. So it's I've been okay, all over the place today. What about your concern? I work a lot with disabilities and different forms of accessibility and what have you. Work a lot in DEI spaces. And while I think there is an important aspect to oral tradition, I think that also is unfair to those that aren't necessarily always present and available in those, in those cases, as well as those who have disabilities that involve languages and learning disorders. Um, I spoke on a panel this past week as part of Articore where people were talking about having apaxia and having language processing disorder. And so it takes them that much more work to be bards and learn things by language, to learn th the things simply by reading or hearing in that manner. Um, I know, I don't like talking about myself. Uh, I have a neurologic condition myself where I have difficulty with um, memory gaps and what have you. And it's not a, it's not a, a um, even enough occurrence 
for me to say that this always works for me or this doesn't work for me. And while I'm saying, I'm not saying that it's uh, awful for us to keep on with oral tradition. I think it's, a, it's an important aspect within the society. I think that having accessibility and resources for people of different forms and different walks of life is, is, is more important. In my opinion, I think we need to be making more efforts to have accessibility. Um, I can tell you because as the keeper of the current hood, I have spoken to previous people of the hood and previous keepers of the hood have told me that the bar tradition within the kingdom has struggled because of gatekeeping. And because specifically of people saying that bardic tradition should be this one way. And I really think that we need to be going away from discussions of it has to be this one way. We need that to I would say, um, I too have a neurological disorder and it is so extreme that nobody in the SCA knew about it for decades because I wasn't gonna have it get between me and fighting. <laughs> But um, it, it also impairs my speech. It works with, you know, it's, it's what you said, very, very much in, in difficulty for me. It's, it's difficult for me to um, even speak sometimes. And I had to overcome that. But also um, there's ways for people to be nurtured into the responses that allow them to entrain. And I'm also a member of Heart Math preparation. and uh, preparation helps. And working um, both as somebody who has had a neurological issue that has prevented me from prevented me from speaking well, and also um, have, having nurtured those people in my Vicalis Megan singing group myself when we were meeting on Sundays, several of those people were just so afraid and um, worried because they were afraid that they could not themselves come into this process and we brought them into this process and it was awesome. So not, not um, all disabilities are the same. Not that's all true. That's are the true. Same. And I have studied them extensively. So I, I understand this, but my point is um, don't let it stop there. If they need the assistance of the written word, perhaps not at an event, maybe encourage them to try in the presence of other people who are doing the same thing as they are and bring them into the process in a bigger way that nurtures their well-being as well as their expansion, because it is possible. And that is what I do for a living. Robin, uh, Carrot, if yeah. you want. Um, I just wanted to go ahead and add something to what Tanoch was saying and to what you're saying as well. I totally see the value of memorization and performance because of the ease of it. It, it's more authentic. It looks more authentic. It feels more authentic. And it feels great to have a piece you memorize. I mean, Rosa, at my first I step it, I'm just in awe that she had a song memorized for five stanzas. And these were not short stanzas. These were long eight line stanzas. And I'm just like, seriously. But as somebody who you know, tries to do as much with the SCA as possible in addition to their day job. And also as somebody who is a trained musician, it is helpful to have the sheet music and the verse. Because when I was going through and looking at the Anstiorn songs and saw how many of them didn't have music, it would make it harder for me to learn so I could memorize it. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know a lot. I don't know Stan Brother Stan. I just know two lines of Stan Brother Stan. I barely know the melody. And that was gonna be one of the first songs I was gonna put into notation. But there, there's no, but as far as I could find, I couldn't find any sheet music for a lot of the Anstey Orange songs. I couldn't find sheet music to learn it because I learned by using that sheet music. And also as Zuveda can testify, it's good to have things written down for prosperity so yes. that people who come after us can learn those songs. So I totally see what you're talking about. That is a beautiful tradition you're talking about. But from someone like Tenoch or myself, we need that music. We need that written down because we got stuff we're doing in addition to the SCA and things get lost. Things, you forget things. And since I try to do a lot of period stuff, having stuff written down is very, very helpful for me. So I see the value of both, but I'm going to need it written down for me so I can memorize it. Written down is good. I, and then you can memorize it. But keep in mind, we had an entire kingdom singing for 15 years before they started making books out of it. 
to be used during the performance. Yeah, that, that were these, these books were used not during the performance when th once they started, they were used between performances so people could learn, like you say, Robin. Mm. Ivo, oh, yeah. did you have a point you wanted to add in? Yeah, unfortunately, I have an appointment in about 15 minutes, so I didn't want to wait too long. <clears throat> um, I wanted to, three points have come up and I feel they're relevant for your yeah. purposes here with a historian standpoint. Um, one, I am rather amused by the parallels that I'm hearing here with recorded or documented letters written in the 12th, 14th, and 1600s regarding the availability of written music and several very wealthy patrons of Europe who were upset in varying degrees because some people thought having written music expanded their musical retinue and others were incensed that musicians are being degraded to reading music and could not memorize it. So if anyone is particularly bothered by this conversation, they've been having it since the Gutenberg press first put print to paper. I um, love it, Ivo. I love it. The <laughs> other thing I'm going to point out, and this is actually a lesson from Megan um, from way back when, and that's that when someone puts on armor and walks on the field, they're one quarter armor, one quarter guts and 50% passion. Um, and I think we all bring the same thing to this discussion. I just want to encourage everyone not to temper your passion. The heat of passion is what brings the sharpest edge to every blade. But let's remember we're all still friends when the drinks are served an hour from now. Um, I say that as someone who's forgotten that. Uh, the last thing I wanted to point out, again, from a historical standpoint, is you have an unsung hero in this room who's not been pointed out for this. But when I first started playing, uh, then her ladyship, Rhiannon, was one of the very few who had published electronic audio files before we were calling it downloadable music of her music um, this was in parallel with the red wolf songbook and more recently with covid i believe it was Rannon, Rhiannon who cracked the puzzle of how to coordinate singers on zoom even though they cannot even though zoom doesn't sync its audio very well that may seem like a small thing but with zoom not going anywhere um, i think the good mistress put a very important keystone in the bridges that help us beat each challenge as the generations come on. And that is commendable. Um, it may not be a, a laurel level performance, but it is a, I would argue a peerage level skill to solve those problems. So you have, you have someone who's made two bits of history there in this room. Love um, that, I know. And uh, well la <clears throat> last but not least, I will point out that you have um, a very large number of heralds in this room, vo voice heralds, and that is no accident. The, uh, the bardic arts and their need to command an audience and articulate information is a parallel that is very strong in the heraldic community. And if you look at some of the best heralds out there, um, one of whom, two of whom I would argue are in this room, um, they can speak for themselves. Uh, they draw on their heraldic, they draw on their bardic skills to make their heraldic presentations solid. And I would even say I've seen some of their bardic performances where you see them borrow some pages from the, the Herald's Handbook of how to increase pomp and circumstance a little more. So um, I, bardic is one of those skills I had to get out of because being a, a sight herald, your throat shot at sunset. You can't you can't do bardic, you can't sing, it's literally dangerous for you. So I got out of it for that reason. But the bardic arts, um, the bardic arts are integral to Steora and it's made up of every little piece, including the ones that butt heads every other word. Um, that's part of the process and I look forward to it because we get some good results that way. And I will add everyone here, um, my personal nudge, Make sure to do some research into the history of whatever your craft is, because as I said, I'm able to look at this conversation smart because it's an argument we've been having for 600 years and we'll probably have it for another 600 more. I love your words, Ida. Ida thank you. So my next question for the group is if you were to name one song that is quintessentially on Steorin, what is it in your heart? And what is that? Okay, we have Stan Brother Stand. We have one vote for Stan Brother Stand. Do we have any other votes for Stan Brother Stand as the quintessential Unstayorn song? Okay, that's two, three, four. What about Farewell to Unstayora? 
I've never heard that. Does that does that resonate with anybody? And there's one other one. Um, born on the list field. But no, born on the well. list field is. But it's not on Steyron. One of those. Oh, it is. is. Oh, oh my gosh. That was written by <laughs> know, That was written by the second line of Ansteora while he For, resided here. Me, I, I didn't know. I've heard it in other kingdoms more than I've heard it here. So I I okay. forgive me. I was kind of had the, uh, a presence me. then. <laughs> Please yeah, go Robin. Robin. Please go I ahead, Robin. You are both correct. It was written in Calentier. By an on stay on who had just moved to Kalantir. No, so he hadn't moved to Kalantir not... yet. He gave us the preview of it long before he moved. We were his personal friends and saw him every weekend. And he um, called us up and said, Joni, Rich, <laughs> that's our names. I said, I got this song I want to talk to you about. And so he said, you know, uh, he, he was all excited. He sang it for us. And um, we, we heard it over pizza, actually. And um, it was long after that that he moved to Kalantir and it was presented to Kalantir. But he wrote it here in Ansteora on Ansteorian grounds. It was performed here, too. And, yeah, it was performed here before he ever moved to um, Kalantir. And we still stay in touch with him about every other week. It's touching. This isn't it's something from the past. It's something from, you know, that we know of him personally now. When I think about the music uh, that is a part of our culture and our heritage. Could I ask you to speak up a, a little lot bit? Of great Fionn? songs, but there's really only two that come to mind that are quintessentially part of On in history. And those are the two that we've mentioned. So Stan Brother Stan and Born on the List Field. You could flip a coin and take your pick. And if you took a poll of the kingdom, it might be split right down the middle. And and it would probably, if you had to rank them, you could alternate one and two depending on which one it is. They're just, they're they're ubiquitous. And it yeah. might be 100% for both. <laughs> Rosa. <laughs> Rosa, did you want to chime in? Uh, yes, actually, uh, kind of going on the, uh, the wake of Finn is uh, what I was noting is the wonderful cross-section we have of the performing arts here in Anstiora. We have some from the very beginning and we have our most recent. And as um, Ivo pointed out, you know, there's some things that, you know, don't change and that is the ebbing and flowing of popular songs. And I do know that, uh, you know, again, Stan Brother Stan was my knee jerk reaction. And then I remembered, oh yeah, there's the Filk Rising of the Star, which, you know, I had heard a tale at one of the anniversaries that they had collected all the verses, and I think there was like 30 verses at that point. And I found that rather interesting that depending on where you're at in your tenure in our kingdom in the SCA will be really where is. your memory is of prominent music uh. and memories. And so, yes, for some of the more established people, I can see where Born on the List Field would be, you know, that's an Anne Steorn song because it was sung constantly. Because there's, I remember doing pieces and being told, oh, yeah, we, we've done that all the time. It's been wore out. And, you know, so it takes a break for a while and comes back. So uh, my quintessential memories for uh, Anne Steorn songs would have been uh, Stan Brother Stan and then... Uh, Rising of the Star, because that literally is talking about, you know, where we come from with Aidenveld, and it talks about the women and the men and the children and the bards, and just has a really great tongue in cheek approach to our kingdom and the game we play. Thank you, Tenok. Yeah, um, I think actually Rosa kind of said what I was going to say in a in different form of fashion that. I do think that the, the point you begin playing in the SCA, especially the point you begin playing in, in Anstiora, really does determine which which pieces are quote unquote quintessential to you, because you really draw on the culture around you at the time. Um, and since so much of Bardic Arts is community based, whatever community you enter and at the time you enter that community, those are going to be the things that stick with you the most. Um, I know actually the first NCR song I ever learned, and I'm and I'm once again I'm fairly young in this, so <laughs> very very young in this. Um, 
the first uh Aunt Sierra song I ever heard was um the Sable Star Alone. That was the first Aunt Sierra song I ever heard. Was what Tanak I didn't hear? Uh the Sable Star Alone. Okay. Yeah, so that was the first one I ever heard. Um because it was sung at one of my first events. It was it was kind of the uh piece that was shared there. Um I know that as a current Kingdom Bard, um, the one that's on the back of my lyre, <laughs> the back of the Kingdom Lyre is Stand Brother Stand. And as someone who's arranging all the has has been arranging uh Bardic openings for the for uh their majesties during the pandemic, um, the number one song everybody wants to do is Stand Brother Stand. But their majesties uh requested that I for their as their bard do um Born on the List Field. So I can see how both of those would be would be important songs because they represent different histories and they different they represent different perspectives as far as where people come in. And everyone is going to I think this is one of those things that everyone is going to have a different perspective based on how you've been playing, how long you've been playing, where you came in, what group you've been playing in, et cetera, et cetera. And what they're emotionally attached to. Yeah, really. So my next question is. I'm sorry, go ahead, Lillis, if you wanted to speak to that point. Oh, just, just briefly, because, of course, all of these are songs that I've heard and I love. Um, and, of course, Born on the List Field was one of the first I ever learned from oral tradition because Ulf was teaching it, but he would not let you have the words. You had to learn it from Ulf um, many years ago. But I don't think I heard anyone mention Just One Time by Darius of the Bells. No, I didn't hear that one mentioned. Um, which is one of the ones I think of, and it's been around for quite a while. Um, and I've heard people sing it in Bardic many, many times. I know. Um, but I would like to speak to Born on the List Field. Ivar Battlescald himself, second line of Anstoyar, requested that it only, only be right. transmitted orally. And, and that I is have what that from his called. mouth, from the day he wrote it. <laughs> Robin, Carrot? Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, when I came into the SCA and I'm pretty new myself, I didn't know or have the opportunity to learn the Anstey Oren songs. I didn't really know they existed until like shortly afterwards. And when I competed in my first I step it, I wrote an Anstey Oren song. So kind of as a sub question to the previous question, do you all think that there is a place for new Anstey Oren songs? Of course, absolutely, mm -hmm. please. I'm I mean, because I felt like I could write a praise. I could, I mean, heck, I have musical background. I can write music. I can write a praise song to Aunt Dior, and I performed it at my first I step it. <laughs> the the river flows on. Run. Let's do that, please. Um, I wanted to do a couple of things. Zubeda, yes. how close are you to bringing this full circle? Uh, we've got another hour that's scheduled, but uh, as okay. has been my habit, if people are talking, I'm not going to close the door. I just didn't want to derail your purpose here, but I wanted to show you, this is mine, and I got busy fighting. The screen. I will. Um, I'm trying to show this to you. You're and too I, close. Okay, too close to the screen. Let's see. Yeah, Unfortunately, your virtual out. background it's, is causing you and it. I think so. I think so. Um, it's the wrong color. There's, I'm holding up a blue sash. The blue sash has fringe on both sides, and it has bric-a-brac of different kinds across the bottom of um, both sides of the sash. And what we did in the early days of um, the Queen's Bards of Ansteora was um, anybody who performed somewhere put a piece of bric-a-brac that was assigned to that, that event on their sash. I think I had about 10 that I earned and I put two on there or something like that because I just got busy. But my passion comes from having been a crafter of the early years of Ansteora where we passed down tradition in the ways of the Middle Ages. And as Ivo says, that, that's an old story. Um, he brought up a beautiful point there. That story is very old. It goes back farther than the 12th, the 12th century. It goes back to old Ireland, at least that I know. And um, what I would like to hope for is that we can practice our songs between events in um, with our music, but 
with our events have enough people that know the words that they bring people in and help them entrain to what's happening, that they feel relaxed, comfortable, joyful, and um, like full participants in the story of that fireside. One time, we didn't know that this was going to happen. Uh, we'd been doing Megan Singers for about six years or five years at this point, and Bjornsborg had an event. And we were down there at the event. And by that time, our, our songs had sprung, uh, had spread both north and south. And there was an event. We, we gathered around the fire, the bonfire, and we didn't know it was going to happen. It wasn't like planned to have singing or bard craft or anything. And a few people told stories. And then somebody started a song and we sang for like seven hours. 350 people sang every single song, many of them twice, three times. And then later in the evening, we got into weird filks. <laughs> But the whole point of that is the whole kingdom at that place was singing together. That's a lot of us at that time was in one place. And um, Ivar Skolgrim can tell you that story. It was awesome. It was amazing. Many people had not heard those songs before and they found themselves singing because they were brought into the flow of the heart energy of that moment and that time. And that bringing people into the heart energy is part of Bardcraft too. So if we can do this without bringing out books at events and leave the books, books at places where we, we practice between events, it's a lot richer for everybody. And if we can't, we can't. But if we can, there's no gatekeepers here. There's just hope for something that was as rich as what we have all experienced at one time. So the next topic topic I wanted to move us towards um, is judging. Um, how, how does judging happen when bardcraft is such an enormous tent? If someone's doing interpretive dance and someone else is doing lyre music and someone else is reciting limericks while sword dancing, how do you judge that? And this is from someone who hasn't seen that many bardic competitions this is just me actually honestly asking the question because i know that we've got at least four or five of you that have judged competitions um rhiannon would you um one of the things that i would say is especially at the smaller events uh or at the regional events i will have heard a person i will have heard a person perform all summer long i will have judged them in all of the bardic competitions and so there may come the point where it is simply their day. Those are the best performances that any of us have ever heard out of that person. And so perhaps they are not, you know, if you were going to make some sort of a judging sheet, perhaps they are not statistically the best, but we can all agree that that is their day. Um, that, that they have owned the field it. <laughs> and, it's, and it's their moment. And so um, I, you know, I, I feel like that's a difference between um, performance A and S, where we are very, very particular about what it is that we're looking and uh, Bardic, where there is this ephemeral part of what we're looking for. Um, we had been talking about being able to command the floor. Yes. Uh, also, just when the person themselves knows, and I know that the fighters feel this too, there's a day where they own the field. There's a day where it, it's simply their day. Um, and I want to make sure that I always honor that. <laughs> <laughs> Master Robin? Anybody who believes that they have a good answer to your question is a poor judge. None of us are capable of judging all of it. I was at one kingdom I said that I was one of the judges. We had a panel of five and it was one of these where two people were called up. They both performed and we chose the winner. So it's only comparing two performances, okay? Throughout the entire competition, not once did all five judges agree, not once. <laughs> now, what does that mean? Among other things that if one judge got changed, different people win all the way along the way. Mm -hmm. It is not true that anybody can expect to always win 
It is not true that anybody can pick the best performance. Several years ago, there was a uh, project to get English professors from around the world to pick the greatest novels ever written. Now, this is far greater work than any of our performers will ever do, okay? These are judges who have studied it, made their lives on studying it, spent years reading, contemplating, considering these things. They didn't agree. It is simply not true that we can ever choose a best performance. Edgar Allan Poe said, the final arbiter of art is taste and taste is going to matter. Um, there's a legal maxim. Any judge, any lawyer knows the law. A good lawyer knows the exceptions. A great lawyer knows the judge. <laughs> <laughs> I have occasionally changed what key piece I was going to perform based on who was judging. I love it. I love it. I'm seeing a lot but of odds from Alden. Yeah. I am absolutely certain I have been in many competitions where I lost in the final round and many competitions where I won the final round that different judges would have chosen it differently. Mm -hmm. So can you judge it? No, you can't. When somebody does something I know nothing about, what am I going to do? I still have to judge it. There's a story about an umpire in a baseball game. Mm -hmm. And he was turned around when the guy slid in the first base, the umpire couldn't see it. It was behind him. And he instantly called the guy out. And he explained later, okay, you don't understand. My job isn't to always be right. My job is to give an answer right now so we can continue playing. I hope to always be right. But I've never gone back and looked at that film to see if he was really out or not because my job was to make an instant call. Judges at a competition have to say, that person is winning today and we are often wrong. And both judges and performers have to recognize that just as no performer is perfect, no judge is perfect. And even if the judge were perfect, we would still disagree because the things that appeal to my heart are not the things that appeal to your heart. Judging is an infinitely complex problem that we will never solve. And we have to might accept I, it. Might That's I say case. that the, Zubeda may have been asking a simpler question than, than the way we are answering it. Were you asking for what are the things that we look for in, uh, in, in good Bardic competitions? And as Robin is saying, each of us will have a different answer to that. Um, I didn't ask my question very well. Can I interject um, something? Oh, please, Your Grace. Uh, this, this is strictly from the point of view of, uh, of the king and queen. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, <clears throat> generally have a, a bard that is the royal bard. He's basic, he or she. Can't hear you, Chuck. How you doing, kid? Can't we hear are, you. Uh, you can't hear me? No, that's better. Please. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll get a little closer. Um, the, we, we tried to find not maybe not the best, but the uh, bard that represented who we were when we were on the throne. And uh, that was hard competition because there were some very, very fine bards that uh, didn't reflect. And uh, yeah, so that, that the only judge of who's going to be my bard was me. OK, so that brings a really good historical point. Um, our first premier bard was in 1982, and that was Jonathan Delafison. Yeah. And he would have been premier bard under Lloyd von Aker and Joycelyn in their second reign. So our sixth crown. Did it used to be that the premier bard was not autom automatically the royal bard? Okay, let me back up. I think I'm the only one here who can give the actual history. Yeah, you are. Premier bard was not 
a kingdom position. Right. It was the premier bard of the Queen's College of Bards. Thank you. The crown usually didn't care, often wasn't there, um, but it was a position within the college. Only after the College of Bards were destroyed by the crown did Premier Bard become something that was part of the kingdom rather than part of the college. Okay. Um, when did that happen? I, and why was it destroyed? The college, I mean, well, destroying? Yeah. Excuse me. I'm sorry, I, I, I shouldn't have interrupted. Uh, you just said something that my historian brain locked on. <laughs> Who destroyed the Queen's College of Bards? When did this occur and why did it occur? Um, William the Bear as king. Um, let me back up a little. I, I, I'm gonna try to be fair here and there are very strong feelings on both sides and I'm on one of those sides. Okay, so that would have been 1992? About, no. No, no later. Later than that. A little earlier, but not much. No, that later. would have been right, yeah. It was later. It was William, later. William Misko was 1992. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, what happened was the College of Bards was great for a lot of people. I'm one of them. Without the College of Bards, I am not a bard, period. That's it. Um, it was great for a lot of other people. But it had its structure, and a lot of people who were bards who didn't fit that structure were annoyed by it. For one thing, you can't progress in the college if you only do one style. If you do stories, but not songs or poems, you can't go above a certain level. And there were levels to earn because it was built like a guild. So um, I knew that I would never reach the highest levels because I can't sing. But there were people who really, really didn't like it and felt excluded because the college was pushing this kind of thing. Do you remember the time period? The college you also held local body competitions in every uh, branch. And by the college, I mean Willow. And they were judged by Willow. And she said, okay, now you're the bottom of the steps. Well, the steps hadn't heard that. And the steps hadn't approved of that. And there was a time when we had to say, okay, no, this is the steps bond of the Queen's College of Bonds. In any event, lots of little missteps along this way meant a lot of people were really pissed at the College of Bonds because they felt they were being excluded. Why did they feel this way? Because they were being excluded. Now, I'm speaking as someone who loves the college, who was made a bard because of the college, but Willow was never able to completely understand other people's political views. And it got where it annoyed enough people and eventually the king said, no, cancel it. In the next reign, a bunch of us got together and tried to build a new structure that would be the Kingdom College of Bards. It would be the Queen's College of Bards with the serial numbers filed off. And that sort of hung around for about a year, but it really never did anything. So in the very early 90s, and the Queen's College of Bards was really, really big in the late 80s and early 90s. And one of the many things it did was it encouraged more and more people to be Bards. This is something else that bothered a lot of people for a very straightforward reason. This means lots and lots of people who can't perform are standing up and performing. Now, a bad dress doesn't take anything away from good dresses. A bad piece of metal look does not take away from great piece of metal looks, but a bad body competition that no one wants to listen to means no one else is performing just then. And we got lots of people who got really good over time because they started out bad and got to keep performing. And I'm speaking as one of them. Nonetheless, one of the reasons a lot of people didn't like the College of Bards is because it encouraged people who can't perform well to perform. So there's this, this ever-growing rift. And eventually, the college got stepped on. And another thing to add to that, as long as Willow was queen, her prerogative to have the queen's bard, bards was one thing. And she should really be applauded for what she did start. But once she was no longer queen, 
it was harder for her as Duchess to um, govern that body and or give it up or give it up and everything else that Robin said followed too. Okay. How is the name of our premier bardic competition pronounced? I Stedfan. The, the double Welsh. D is pronounced T H, hard T H. The single D at the end is pronounced D. I Stedfan. Okay. Because I've never been able to figure that one out. <laughs> Ever. You're, you're not alone. So we get the crowns and the people running the competitions and the heralds pronounce it correctly. We can't get the kingdom to. <laughs> <laughs> So one of the things I wanted to ask about is one of the, the major points of resistance that I've gotten over time about the Kingdom Wiki, which is the front-facing publicly accessible records of the historian's office, is the SCA is an oral tradition, and if we can't remember it, then it shouldn't be remembered. And I am obviously adamantly opposed to that concept because of issues of accessibility and uh, inclusion and not everybody gets to travel over the entire kingdom. And I've never heard the songs that are specific to down south and down south may not have ever heard the songs in the histories specifically to the north. And we aren't Welsh bards or the traveling folks from, you know, the beginning of our country who would go around and speechify in the public square to tell the news of the town down the road. We don't do that. We sing songs and we do performances, but unless the history, the item of history has been worked into a performance, which is then performed by hundreds of people, it gets lost. So my question in a very, very roundabout way is, what piece of Anstiorin history did you learn about from a song? And how do we get more people to write stories about a historical item? I'm kind of thinking about sponsoring a competition. Just I got to chime in here just because Please. this may get heavy. OK. Um, so I'm going to start with something not heavy. OK. And through Please Bardic, the history that I learned was Law Green Mead. In a song. Was what? I'm sorry? Law Green Mead. Okay. Oh, God. I know, <laughs> I know I'm before that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I have Green heard Mead. other historical pieces since then. Mm -hmm. But my first one that sticks with me and, and the little kind of addendum to this was I had a fangirl moment when I started meeting some of the people in person that were in the song after I'd heard this song for majority of my time in SCA. And I'm just kind of going, this is sad. I'm having a fangirl moment over these people, but um, it's, I don't know if you're familiar with that song, Raw Green Mead. No, it, it's about drinking raw green mead and the horrible things that go with it and inflicting it on your friends. Okay. So, you know, it's, I, uh... it's quite the shenanigans. Tenok asked me to restate the question. Um, the specific question that I was asking in a roundabout way is, what historical moment of Onstegora in history did you learn about through a song performed in Onstegora? Finn? And I'm sorry, is it Theon or is it Finn? It's Finn. Thank you. So um, it's not a song per se, but it is... <clears throat> written by uh, Master Cedric Fithelier. Uh And he came up to me after he saw me perform at Candlemas once and told me that he wanted me to learn this poem that he wrote. And he said it was the one that really kind of put him over to being a laurel. And mm -hmm. the poem is called The Birth of Fame, and it is about the Battle of Burrow Hill in the early, early days of Onstiora uh, under uh, uh, Sir Sean. And it talks about 
this battle that took place and some of these uh, great figures of our history. You know, it talks about how uh, of Simon's leadership on the battlefield and uh, how they fought against the Western Kingdom and they fought for uh, Ottenvelt and King Chorus and all of these people. And he, re and he did such a masterful job of telling the story and uh, and bringing these names and history to life with it that once I had learned it, I got a chance to actually perform it for Simon and hear him go, well, it's mostly right. <laughs> it was a little different, but that's close. So that yeah. that's the one that sticks out for me, and it's and it's one that's not, it's one that's not common. I'm it doesn't get performed right hardly ever. It's not you know commonplace like most of the songs yeah. of our kingdom, but yeah. it was important in my growth as a bar. Thank you, Alden. Did you have something you wanted to add? Uh, yeah, I think, Orm, did you have something? Me myself. Yeah. Yeah, I thought you were uh, Yeah, I just had a comment about the raw green mead. <laughs> I, I am the perpetrator of the piece of Von Steering history. I won a competition of some type, and the prize was mead, and it was from a person who was uh, making his first batch and had no clue about exactly when it should come off. So, <laughs> but, but since I don't drink, uh, alcohol. I uh, handed that to one of my friends, uh, Ragnar Morkul, who was friends of uh, people in Onstera, uh, Moonbeer being one of them, who actually glommed on to it qu pretty quickly. And uh, it was so impressive that Ragnar wrote that song <laughs> to commemorate the, the um, Things that you must be be aware of, but I had no intention of any of that happening. It's, I just happened to be the ori trader. <laughs> origin of the bottle to those people. So, Remember, but anyway, that's a piece of history, yes. so and, and, and it's actually, from what I understand, a blow by blow accurate in, depiction of <laughs> what happens. Okay, well, Spada, but, I, I'm I'm going to not answer your question in two different parts. Um, okay. <laughs> to me, to me, there is no um, one quintessential historical conveyance in bardic performance um, that stands out to me. But what does stand out to me is, is probably my, one of my favorite things uh, to hear because anybody can perform it. And if you'll pardon the, the expression, it's the no shit there I was stories. Those are bardic performances and everybody tells them. Um, and I've heard some great stories from people uh, who would never call themselves a bard. Um, but that is in that moment, they are a bard. Um, but I would also like to say some of the best historical pieces of information I have ever heard or gotten have been from Master Robin. He, he teaches uh, many heraldic classes on especially precedence, and, and he has the stories of how all these awards came to be, uh, and that enriches our kingdom so much. And, and I, I would very much like to thank you, Master Robin, for, for always teaching that class. And I will take it as many times as I can when you offer it. Uh, he very kindly came and kind of taught it at a historian's chat, which I need to post on my YouTube channel. Um, Tanakh, did you have a comment? Uh, I'm just going to kind of piggyback on what Alden said and agree with him about um, how much I have personally learned about the history of Ansiara through Master Robin. Um, and I have to say that as someone who has not interacted with him much beyond these virtual spaces. But I mean, I uh, I was a relative nobody <laughs> and very much a newcomer when I won <laughs> the Premier Bard competition before the pandemic started. And I didn't get to do the, the victory tour, so to speak, where I go around and actually meet 
all the bards <laughs> of Anseora. <laughs> I didn't get to go to Gulf War and interact with people and get to learn firsthand what it means to wear this hood. I didn't get to learn that because I didn't get to have that in-person experience because I literally won. And then two weeks later, the world shut down. So everything <laughs> has been very much through osmosis in any point of shape or form I can. And I'm very fortunate that I have um, that I have some bards I'm very close to that are former premier bards. And so they've been willing to, you know, help guide me along the way and give me advice here or there. But um, Master Robin's words that he shares throughout these chats, uh, I have learned so much, so much from everything that you share. Um, and it's helped me learn more about what it means to be not just a premier bard, but also a bard about Sayora. And it's also helped me learn to how to talk to other bards and learn the history and learn where we're coming from and kind of fill in the gaps, you know, and um, I'm sure you, you, you've told me yourself, you know, some of that history is not always pretty. <laughs> it's kind of messy, but it's important for us to learn that. It's important for us to know all of that and know where we come from, the good and the bad. And it only makes us better to, to learn all that. And so, yeah, yeah so just kind of piggyback, you know, uh, well, don't you, said. don't you guys think that, the wiki is an excellent source for bardic material. It could be oh, if yeah. we had more bards participating. It, but, it, but we yeah. don't. <laughs> so I got to chime in because, you know, kind of on, on the tales of what Emin's saying, and also just to kind of address that, you know, you're talking about songs and so forth, and, and we have the storytellers, and we have the poets and so forth. And, based on a historical tale of a member of the kingdom, a well-loved member of the kingdom, because I had heard this story more than once at a fireside, it wound up being fodder for a point. So I have now, you know, memorialized these people in yet another form, uh, you know, in poetry to carry on because this person always told his stories. He didn't write this story down. And, and so, you know, there's, there's the songs and then there's the stories, uh, there's the poetry, and we have had some really great uh, performers of multiple mediums uh, to, you know, we have Finn who does his praise work. Yeah, I, I, yeah, you're not sneaking out of this one, brother. Yeah. Um, so, yes, uh, as, as members of the performing arts, uh, we can need to submit our works to uh, memorialize and uh, to praise uh, those members, whether it be in story, song, poetry, or even some sort of musical interlude. Uh, you know, we, we do need to bring that to you because quite honestly, uh, you are doing the work of a saint, uh, giving this to posterity uh, and saving our posterior. So, yeah, thank you. Well, with that very generous plug, I would like to say that the wiki has space for bards to have songbooks. We can do PDFs of your work. We can do music sheets. We can, there's so much room there. And individual bards can have pages that link to their songbooks. We can upload audio files. All of that is space that is available to our bards. And, and I really wish that more people would use it. Right now we have three people, three people who have submitted their works for inclusion as a songbook on the wiki. Um, and I'm one of them and my stuff is really lame because I only write poetry when I'm mad at people. And uh, yeah, me, me and spite poetry, it's a thing, um, but I never perform it. The bottom line for me kind of comes to something <laughs> that Robin said and Rhiannon said both. And that is, it comes down to a matter of personal preference and heart. I do excuse myself from judging any kind of, um, of art that I have no clue about. If I don't know, I just say, I don't know. I just am not qualified. But if I do step in to judge something, um, which have included kingdom level uh, work, I, I, my final message to myself about what, what person I want to, to value over some other person who has also done an awesome, incredible job 
has to do with their connection from the heart to the rest of the audience. And I watch it in the audience's eyes and I feel it in myself, but a lot of times I'll just watch the audience and watch them gasp. And so for me, that's a big something. And you asked about the wiki. For all that I am so keen on not performing with a work of, um, you know, a book in my hand, I um, value the written word in our histories. You know, I really do. And I really appreciate what you're doing there. And I will try, if my life lets up, I will try to participate more. <laughs> One of these days, we're going to have make that appointment. We're going to do it. And I, I will promise. drive down there with laptop and scanner and camera and, and well, we will yeah, do the thing. I, th I think I might have been a teeny bit misunderstood. I wasn't talking about bards learning from bards from the wiki. I was talking about this, this wealth of stories, that historical yeah. and whatever that could be drawn upon by bards to create new stories. Okay, I think, I think we all may have your... misunderstood then. That's yeah, I wasn't meaning that bards should go seeking bards on the wiki. I'm talking about them seeking his, history for the creation of new pieces of work, for new stories, new songs. Well, that's one area where we are a little bit <clears throat> lacking. We've got lots of pages about people well, and they provide their information, but the stories of the history isn't laid out as as smoothly as it could be, and and that's because I need people to send in more content. Great, Let's keep getting that, that done. But the bards, if they're smart, will look on the wiki and find resources for new stories and songs. And Not then there are only. Stories and songs those bards that live from fireside to fireside and don't even touch the internet either. And the truth is the early on stay or in bards are going to go from fireside to fireside first, because that's where the stories like raw green mead occurred. They were in the moment. Oh, and I know. after they were in the moment, they were told by the fireside and that's where the bards would pick them up and just make havoc with them. And it was wonderful. <laughs> yeah. But, but you, had, you had to, you, you ran across those things that it you, you but, had to be there to hear them, to, you know, to pick them up and move on with. But having the wiki page now gives us that grace. Agreed. There are stories I exactly. can't tell because I wasn't there. So I can retell in my perspective those stories while living the other stories. And, and that is why it's, it's one of my goals. Uh, Thomas of Timby and I have been discussing it when we go back to in person is something I tried to do before, which is uh, Bardic Salons. We're getting a more aged uh, membership and camping is not what it used to be. In some cases it is, don't get me wrong, but in some cases with fuel efficient cars and age populace not wanting to sleep on a sleeping bag or in a cot, they want the comfort of AC in a tent. Their health conditions maybe don't allow it because of their CPAPs or whatever. Um, they're not being able to stay, and so we're getting that brain drain, and it just breaks my heart. So my option for that is uh, to create what is more of a performing arts salon for people to hang out. And there it is a completely free and safe zone to share stories. And not just that, it's, it's share your story, songs, poetry, share your work, but also it's a great place to go, I need to try this out. Can I get some feedback? I'm wanting to learn this. Can you work with me? It's a place that, yes, back in the day, this is what was done at the fireside, but we don't have that like we did at one time. Maybe so time to, to you know, meet it halfway and reintroduce established members with new members. And so the new members get that inspiration because Lord knows I hear some of the stories and I'm like, I have got to go do this. And it gives me inspiration of all the things I can do in this wonderful game. So that is my hope is as we come back into in-person events, you will hopefully be seeing announcements for performer salons and you're just invited to come be an audience member or be a, uh, uh, an active contributor. I love it that you're working with Thomas of Tembe too. 
he can tell some stories. Alden, you oh. and then Tenok. Yeah, a um, couple things. One, uh, one of my memories from I think it was a Ravensfort event uh, in the Bardic competition that they had that day. One of the requirements of a round was to find someone or something on site that day that inspires you and tell a story or, or write something about it and present it. Um, so I think having those instances uh, that include that kind of history, it's history building, really, because it's, it's something that happens in the moment that that inspires you as, as a bard to, to want to relate, um, which I think is fabulous. And I would encourage you know other groups to do that. Um, and also, as, as I have been active in the bardic community for many years, um, and I have been a peer far less than I have been involved in that community. Um, but upon becoming a peer, one of the things I have done is take it upon myself to be the um, motivator to bards uh, by issuing just little challenges to people to, hey, write me a poem in this style. This isn't your usual style. Try something a little different. Um, hey, find something that, you know, somebody that inspires you and, and tell me about them. Um, and, and as a peer, I think that is a good thing that I can give to the kingdom and to those people and then give them some largesse for completing that task. Um, we, we can own this effort that we want to create. Well said. Thank you. Uh, well, I, I think the bards of Ostiora are very lucky to live in Ostiora because during my time, and I, don't, I can't speak for now, but in many kingdoms, Bardic was tolerated, but it was not promoted and not encouraged. Now, I'm talking about many, many of the kingdoms of the known world. Here, it's always been something <clears throat> that we wanted, and we promoted and encouraged it every chance we got. In other kingdoms, not so much. So, you know, I just wanted to point that out from a historical point of view that this kingdom is a damn fine place to be a bard. That's always Very been true, true yes. And, and also, you know, where we are in history right now uh, is a wonderful opportunity for bards with this new principality of mm -hmm. Vintheim that is on Steorn history in the making. Yes, it is. Let's let's not lose sight of it. It is okay. absolutely glorious. Um, Tanakh, you had a point that you wanted to, to bring? Gosh, well, trying to come full circle with all the wonderful points that are being brought up. Uh, I'm going to kind of tie this back to, to um, Wiki and about preserving efforts moving forward. And I think that Hopefully this ties into some of the stuff like what Rose is speaking about is fantastic work and things that I personally resonate with for for all my own oh shit I was there reasons. Um, so first off wiki, uh, I have to apologize <laughs> because I am one of those people that has like not put in the fourth to to you know create wiki entries and and what have you. And then um, one of uh, because I am pandemic bard. I get to be Kingdom Bard during a pandemic, which means all the other Kingdom Bards who are like, how do we preserve Bardic tradition during a pandemic? Oh, let's get all the Kingdom Bards together and talk about ideas and things we do within our own kingdoms and what have you. Uh, I get to meet all, all the other Kingdom Bards. And uh, the he's technically now the former Kingdom Bard because he just stepped down, like, and I mean weeks ago, just stepped down from the East Kingdom. But he made a comment to me personally about how, hey, you don't have a wiki entry. And we kind of, that's kind of really important. Uh, and, he, and then he posted publicly about it. So he just kind of doubled down on that point. Uh, Cause you know, what is friendship if not uh, figuring out how many ways we can embarrass a person that we care about. <laughs> so um, <laughs> then he made a public point about it. Um, and he said some fantastic things about how in these kingdom, their wiki is, is, is so, uh, it's so fleshed out with all the bards because it's not just about preserving history. It's also about resources for newcomers. Uh, East Kingdom is, their bardic tradition is, is, is a, 
it's very much a emergent tradition where they work really, really hard to bring in newcomers. And I'm not saying that we don't do that here. Everyone does that in their own way. We all have our different ways of doing that. But one of the things they do is for as a resource, they like to make sure their wiki is up to date and has bards and what their specialties are so that they can pinpoint and, and direct people directly to which bards if it's something that they're unfamiliar with. And that's something that we often do you know, by word of mouth here. But the more resources, the merrier. The more we can do that, the, the, the more ways we have to do that, the better. Uh, and, and so this ties into Rosa's point that I love the idea of bardic salons because I know for myself that I don't think I would be here if it wasn't for the fact that I just so happened when I was still investigating the SCA, went to a bardic circle that just so happened to be held at one Master Alden Drake's house and not realizing whose presence I was in <laughs> and, and not realizing at all, you know, the history of the bard whose home I was in and just kind of a lot of what I learned about bardic tradition was just listening to him talk and listening to him talk to the other bards that were there and learning learning from that kind of stuff. So Bardic, uh, Bardic Salons, fantastic resources. And then my own, oh shit, I was there moment with that is during virtual era, because of course, pandemic Bard, I get invited to things. Um, the Bard of the West invited me to a Bardic circle a bardic workshop that, that he attends with other established bards of the West and Kaid and the Mist. And I thought this was really fun. And I just thought, oh, I'm just going to nonchalantly go hang out and listen to the Bard of the West work on his uh, piece for um, for their, their next uh, fight, their, their next uh, crown tourney. And so he was working on his piece and having people uh, lob suggestions back and forth. And there was many people giving suggestions and they asked me for suggestions. And then, you know, they asked me to share my work. And then we, we were just lobbing back and forth. Um, I didn't realize this until I was two hours into this group. Uh, I was in the presence of Duke Fleeg, one of the founders of the society. And he was giving me direct feedback on my work, as well as directly saying, oh, yeah, no, I think that's a good point Tenetch brings up. And so it was just one of those like, oh, that's right. Like, <laughs> people... Uh... <laughs> yeah, pe people exist beyond myth and legend. <laughs> Being able to like have that experience where I just suddenly randomly find out that I'm in the presence of a founder of the society um, was a incredibly meaningful experience to me and something that I'm <laughs> going to think about, even if it is in the virtual space, it's just something I'm always going to have in memory. And that is, um, I think, the importance of, as Rosa is talking about, these, these like just nonchalant, not even heavy, they're not for comp competitions they're not even for necessarily workshops so to speak just these salons where we can talk with other bards and share stories and learn more i think that that's a fantastic idea and i'd love to see more of that because i know that there are so many people who are newcomers who are afraid of entering the bardic arts not necessarily because they don't have skill because they have a lot of skill from outside the society it's just they don't know where to begin in the society. They don't know where to begin in Ansteora. They don't know the culture, the history, what have you. And I think being in the presence of others who do, that could be helpful because I don't think I would be here if it wasn't for the fact that I was in the presence of a very established bard when I first started who helped me understand the culture a little bit more and where I could begin within the bardic arts here. Thank you. Uh, Finn, did you want to speak to that? And then we'll go to our next topic. Uh, yeah, just real quickly. Um, Tenoch was mentioning, you know, how much he kind of picked up from other bards and how newcomers are trying to find their way. And I think it's important for us to remember that the, the people that have come before us are, are not just examples of what we can, you know, of what they do, but they're potential examples for what we want to model ourselves after. Um, I've taken, you know, just looking at the room here, there there's two people in particular that have played a huge role in the path that I've chosen to follow. Uh, the first of them is Alden, who... I have had a friendly rivalry with oh, for years uh, 
calling him my nemesis at one point because uh, early on he was the model for what I thought a kingdom bard should be. Uh, he was he's at the top of his game. He's always prepared. He can come and sit down at a table and ask you to pick a topic at random, and then he'll sing a song about it for and do this for an hour. <laughs> and and he's uh, one of the most um, one of the most important lessons I took away from my talks with Alden was when the first time I, I saw him as Kingdom Bard, he said that. He doesn't enter baronial competitions as a kingdom bard because he's already at the pinnacle of the award at that point. And at that point, it's more important to visit these bardic circles and uplift the bardic community there. And that's something that I tried to model myself once I took that on. The other person in the room that I want to that I want to talk about is is Robin, and I know people have dished on Robin a lot, but but he's I'm, Robin <laughs> because he's Robin. But I'm largely known for what I done at uh, at crown tournaments, uh, doing the the introduction, the procession performances, and stuff like that. The idea that I got for that and doing these performances was based on watching Robin do the introduction for Madi and Valeria. And I was just so blown away because it was so different than what everybody else was doing. We had 17 entrants of Sir So-and-So and Lady What's-Her-Face, holders of this and that and the other thing. They're going to win. Hooray, next one's up. Same thing. And it just got... It was so tedious uh, after yeah, a while. It, it is. And then Robin came out and did this poem, and, and I was just like, wow. Wow, I am totally in the moment right now. How great would it be if more people got, got that kind of treatment? So... Uh, and I don't know if I've ever told Robin that, that that was part of the motivation why I went into it, but um, thank you. <laughs> so my last question of the night is, uh, well, last official question of the official time span. Um, if folks want to keep talking, I'm all for that. Um, but we have people from a lot of different backgrounds and uh, for example, um, folks from Anthgard, and I didn't know if those who are from that uh, that organization or from, you know, high school drama club or whatever, what background did you bring in other mediums and in other environments that supported your interests and um, got you comfortable with Bardic? That that wasn't aimed at you at all. No, no, not at all. <laughs> well, I, I can I can start off on these answers. Um, I, of course, you know I'm I'm happy to to give a, a nod to AmpGuard. Uh, though I started SCA long before I did get involved in AmpGuard. That has been okay. Uh, I didn't know that. Actually, yeah, that's actually just been in the last few years that I started okay. participating in AmpGuard um, to to help promote the cross culture um, friendship. You know that we've been trying to build for for many years. There's been a a, a rivalry between these two organizations, mm -hmm. and uh, Baron, uh, His Excellency Master Robert McFarland, um, it was Baron of Stargate in H the Houston area, and really wanted to help build that bridge uh, between these clubs because he thought maybe some Scadians are playing the wrong game. Maybe they'd enjoy Ampguard more. Maybe some Ampguarders would enjoy the SCA more. Um, so. I was the night marshal at the time, and, and we just did practices at the same park that Ampguard played. Um, and my Ampguard friend, uh, Sir Slider, uh, a, a Grand Duke in Ampguard, and I kind of became the unofficial cultural ambassadors uh, between the two groups. So that's been kind of fun. Um, but but my my background has has really goes back to my high school years, 
where I was uh, very involved in musical theater um, and choir uh, for three, three of the four years that I was in high school, uh, and then a year in college I got involved. Um, and then when I was attending the University of Miami, I uh, was fortunate to, to pledge and become a part of the professional music fraternity Phi Mu Alpha, uh, of which I know Robin Carrot is also a member. Um, so I, I've, I've, I've had music as a part of my life for, for many, many years. And the, the irony is, is that I, I came into the SCA and had no interest in doing Bardic. Um, and it wasn't until I was at Gulf Wars 12 that uh, I was coming back into Stargate camp and Gerald of Leesville, uh, you know, called me out as I, I was just listening to the Bardic and enjoying it. And next thing I know, Gerald saying, Alden, sing us a song. And uh, just that's where it began. And I blame Gerald ever since. <laughs> Tenoch. And I'm sorry, am I pronouncing your nickname correctly? Tenoch. It's a crunchy, Tenoch. crunchy Pardon CH me. like church. The, Pardon me. Thank you. I like to tell people it's the church the Spanish brought in. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Tenoch. <laughs> um, so uh, talking about outside experiences into the SCA, um, bringing that to for bringing that to light. Um, and I, I think it's a pretty safe general statement to say most bards within the SCA bring in outside experience in some shape, form, or fashion. Most of us have had some kind of, you know, either schooling or even just like, you know, community experience with it, with with some kind of performing arts. Uh, I know for me, as as um, a minority, <laughs> as as you know, someone who's Latino, like I had a lot of experience with with cultural and uh, and, and artistic expression within the performing arts. And one of the things that I currently am I'm doing a lot of really passionate work on, especially now that the society has made very public statements about not necessarily eschewing European traditions, but making sure that we're inclusive of all period traditions around the world is bringing to light more of the things that happened in period America. And I'm not just talking about, you know, my Mesoamerican Aztec empire stuff that, you know, I often get codified for. I mean, all of the Americas. Um, I work a lot with various Indigenous peoples and First Nations peoples and have been, have been had the, the pleasure to get to speak on panels and stuff. And as someone who gets to wear this fancy hood right now during pandemic time, I get to be uh, this very awesome visible symbol of how much my kingdom supports the fact that I am doing these Indigenous American works and that, you know, I get to promote that and get to say, you know, you can too. Um, just today we had... Um, in, in, to our knowledge, in the history of the society, we had the first ever um, New World Bardic Circle. It was a Bardic Circle completely filled of performers that were doing specifically New World Indigenous American works. Um, and I wasn't the only one there. And if you had told awesome. me a year ago that I wouldn't have been the only one there, I might not have believed you. <laughs> but the fact that so many people showed up um, not just to perform that because we had multiple performers, but people showed up to listen and to be part of that. That right there is, I think, one of those important aspects of bringing in that outside culture and making it relevant. Because we are we are a society of the history of people, and these and history is a living thing. This culture and history that we bring forth, it's living, it is alive, and it represents living people. And being able to, you know find other people that are willing to share that living history of their own, I think is an important part of making this society richer. And so for me, I'm so excited to see people bringing in their own history in ways that they felt might not have been immediately accepted originally within the society to see, to see people bring in indigenous American works. And even like I, I spoke on a panel, uh, part of the Bardock War where people were um, talking about the Middle Eastern works uh, being, being people that were Armenian and Israeli and what have you, mundanely, uh, talking about how they are starting to feel more emboldened by the actions of others who are talking about their histories. That you know they are feeling emboldened to talk about you know and, and share their their period Armenian works or um, various period uh, Jewish works. It's so awesome to see people starting to bring that forth and to start sharing those things, and and that's you know. We often think about the kind of marks we want to leave as bards. If, if I would can be remembered one way, I would hope it to be 
to help people um, feel comfortable bringing forth these things like that it. are their personal identities into the society. Yeah, I like well that. Done. Your Grace Inman? Yeah, I'll, I'll raise my hand. Um, I haven't met most of you guys, but uh, when you hear stories about me, do they ever include Bardic? Mm. Really? Yeah. Yeah. No, they say no, no, no. Uh, uh, playing music in coffee houses down in Oak Lawn for the beat generation before I ended up uh, <clears throat> with an all expensive paid trip to Southeast Asia. Uh, I was also a theater major in college. The uh, first performance I ever did was the opening soliloquy from Richard III. And uh, yes, Duke Jonathan was the first premier bard of Onstiora. Who do you think he beat in the finals? Nice. Little that I did old, not know. Little old me. Yes. Uh, I enjoyed doing Bardic, uh, although other activities took me way away from it. I was probably one of the biggest cheerleaders. So I had my day. You know, I'm glad you guys are having yours. Thank you, Your Grace. Sure. So we've got Robin might Robin might even remember that. I don't know. I have a comment, Zabeda. Yes, please go ahead. And Orm says he does too. Come on back, Orm. No, it's okay. I'm trying to eat. Okay. <laughs> no, he's trying to eat. Okay, comment or no. Um, the reason I want to make this comment is not about myself, because but it's for you who are historians and bards to kind of have a sense of the feeling that the SCA arose from both in its early years. I think I came in in AS9 or something like that. And, um, and the early years of Onsteora were, were derived from. And the people that were leading the way back then were people who were expanding in possibilities, okay? You're seeing that again now and all the internet stuff, we're expanding in possibilities. Yes, we are. But guess what? That's been done. Numerous, numerous times before my time, okay? So um, out of that came a very big interest in the literature of the time that, that we were attuned to. And for some reason in early on Steora, and we don't know how this happened, but this might be of interest to some of the bards, um, a certain number of people met who had been reading their own classical literature for some time. And that's what brought us to the SCA, not because we wanted something from the SCA, but because there was this resonant thing, oh, we're doing this and those people are doing that too. And so I met Ivar, who was reading the um, Swedish classics. I, I met Orm, who was reading the Danish classics and so on and so forth, okay? And all of a sudden we came together in this cauldron, uh, this wonderful container of magic that um, we all kind of resonated with each other. And that doesn't mean we agreed with each other that we all did the same thing at all. Um, I was very much Irish. My background had been in song circles of the 70s, 60s and 70s to answer Zubeda's specific question. What did you do as a bard before you came to the SCA? I'd spent at least 10 years with an auto harp in song circles in the park, uh, the park culture of the USA and probably maybe two people in this whole group know what that was. <laughs> and um, it was awesome. And it really informed what the early SCA was here because it was that same culture of fireside life that was so awesome in the early SCA here. <laughs> and special um, thanks today to Rhiannon and um, to Alden and to Technoch for your words, because they have inspired and inspiration is part of what bards do. So thank you. But I wanted to answer your question. So thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate you all joining me this evening. Um, if folks wanna keep hanging out and talking, I am all for that. I do have one last question. If people wanna chime in for it or if they want to head off, um, the hour is late, but um, 
Tell me about a bardic performance that inspired and touched you deeply. I'm sorry, I can't hear you, Robin. This was a poem that Cadfin wrote. Cadfin was the young bard of Gilwell. Uh, okay. when I had a household back in 79, 80, 81, 82. And he wrote a piece about the beginning of Von Steyr. Now, he wasn't there. He just collected information from other people. And so it is very inaccurate in lots of ways, but it all works. And he absolutely believed it all the way through. And listening to the chanson de Von Steyr was when I said, I want to be a bard. No, I knew I couldn't. I mean, I have a funny voice that people have laughed at all my life. But um, that piece and his absolute commitment to it made me want to be a bug. I've performed it occasionally once I finally got the words from it. I want to hear it. <laughs> I, I want it written down so that we can put that on the wiki. <laughs> I've got it written down, but you need his permission. Uh, he and I are currently talking on a thread. I'll see if I can poke him and harass him. Okay. Does anyone else have a pivotal performance that they got to witness? Ted now? I got one. Oh, your grace? Yeah, it's, it's short. Finzik 20. Okay. Our army marched as an army from battle from the campsite to the battle and back again. Mm -hmm. And every single time we marched, we sang Rising of the Star. Uh -huh. You had an entire army marching to the battle and limping home from the battle, singing the Rising of the Wasn't exactly what you meant, but by God, it was moving. <laughs> And I haven't been moved so much since then. Very nice. The person who wrote that is no longer um, with us, but it was Alaric of House. Was it Morningstar? No. Um, um, I forget. But um, he wrote also the, the thing that was very surprising to me. When I became princess of the Outlands, they took me off and fed me at the Mont in Norman and uh, sang a song to me. And Alaric, the same person, sang a song to me that um, just stirred my soul and made me determined, determined to come back to Ansteora. And it was a farewell to Ansteora that he had written for me when I left as princess. Yep. I've not heard that one either. Um, oh, come on, Sue. <laughs> okay. I, I don't get to stay. I, I'm one of those people. I have to leave right after court, and I don't get oh. to stay for and the late night fires and things. They, they just don't sing it. They don't. Whenever I sing the rising of the star or farewell to our Ansteora, they don't know who like, it's about. I've yeah, I've never heard that before. So, um, yeah, yeah I actually heard. Songs that have gone. <laughs> I actually heard rising of the star before I heard stand brother stand. Fun fact. So interesting interesting history so i actually do know that one i feel i feel like captain america in that moment we're like oh i get that reference i do know that one <laughs> I, yeah. that's funny I love that. but it's also different parts of the kingdom right um so uh i'm in the extreme northern part um and you are much further south with many more people yeah uh Tenoch, did you have a performance that you particularly love and you wanted to yeah, I'm um, sorry. I got distracted by a very lovely lady who joined our presence. So, nice. <laughs> and now she's gone. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So I, uh, whenever anyone talks, asks me what what uh, performance inspired me, um, and she knows this because I always put her on the spot about it, and I make her sing <laughs> it every time we're in a bardic circle. Um, <laughs> so, Lady Kara Mac and Gavin. Um, Oh gosh, she's a phenomenal bard for once. I'm already getting emotional choking up about it, <laughs> uh, thinking about it. Um, before I was a member of the society, I was brought into the, the society as an investigator by my partner, who ironically enough, now I'm more active than he is. 
um, <laughs> but uh, like far more active than he is. But he brought me in um, and for, for a long time tried to, tried to get me to come to stuff with him. But I didn't want to like sit out in the sun and watch people hit each other with sticks in the heat, in the Texas heat. That wasn't something I was interested in personally. Uh, so that, you know, the first six months or so of us dating, that was, that was what he kept trying to get me to go to. And I wasn't interested in that. And then he told me, um, come to one event. This one's indoors. It's air conditioned. And it's arts and science focused. So there's classes you can take, and there's even a bardic competition. Uh, and it was the uh, Serpent Symposium Loxolier in, uh, I don't remember the AS year, so I'll say the mundane year. It was, it was uh, 2018. Um, and so that was, I wasn't, I was, I was nobody. I'm, I'm just coming. I just so happened to know people in the society because I had friends that were Skadians. But uh, I, don't, I don't know anything about the SCA. Um, I come and I attend classes and it's actually really interesting and I have a lot of thoughts about that kind of stuff. But then I attend the Bardic uh, competition at the very end and everybody is singing and I'm sure we can all agree that uh, while everyone's Bardic is important, sometimes there's just certain people that stick out to you. Um, and in the final round, uh, Kara sang and I always butcher the name. I never, always, I never remember. I always ask her to sing this one song, and I never remember the freaking name. I'm pretty sure it's the Lowlands of Highland. Is the name of the name is no, nope. Finn's gonna correct me. The Lowlands of Holland. Lowlands, Lowlands of Holland. Holland. There you go. I always forget something with with the name, but she knows it because I tell her that it's my favorite piece because when she sang it in this noisy church hall that had terrible acoustics with people talking in the background and so you're really struggling to hear the piece um her performance captivated the entire hall mm. it really filled up that hall i don't and... know that i can do such justice but tenok knowing that you love it i will sing it i helped teach it to the kingdom i mm. love that song mm. the other person the... who um helped teach it and helped spread it was fiona and she's no longer with us lady fiona Mm. Fionn or Finn, did you want to go? Yeah. Um, so, aside from doing the processions, largely the other part of what I'm known for is skaldic alliterative verse. Mm. And uh, when I got started in Bardic, I didn't have any real direction. I knew that. Uh, I watched some other people do it, and I was like, wow, that looks like a lot of fun, and I'd like to tell a story, mm -hmm. but I wasn't really sure where I fit in. And I'd been in the SCA for two years, a year and a half, and uh, Sir Dietrich Tempenich von Eltz, uh, or Hans Kleermacher, if you're in the mud, uh, wrote a skaldic verse for me for my birthday and it resonated so strongly and it 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 just made me feel so good that i was like i i want to do this i want to do this for other people other people if i can make other people feel the way i felt when that was done for me that's what i want to do and uh it just it became my passion from then on and the bulk of the the bulk of the stuff that i do is all original and written about on Orans in our current time and it's largely hoping that they get some little measure of joy like i did so so two points real quick about that number one that's word fame and you can submit it to the wiki and i can put it on their page um and two because of you i have actually struggled to read through the Wiki, uh, wikipedia definition of skaldic poetry and gone to other resources because i was so darn impressed by a performance of yours that i got to see in a royal court so while i don't generally do that sort of thing uh, at all whatsoever not even a little tiny bit um the strength of your performance, even having no idea what you were saying, was so strong that I was like, okay, I, I, I need to learn more about that. So um, your reach is stronger and further than you know. 
Um, Rhiannon, did you have something you wanted to add? Did I? I did. I, I don't know that this is, you know, the very most memorable, um, but we haven't said a name tonight, which I feel like before we leave, we should, which is uh, Lucas. Um, oh, so yes. Master Lucas, uh, you know, Lord Lucas at the time, um, was the was the person that I really looked up to as a bard. And I remember uh, uh, he had a he had a friend um, in a wheelchair that he brought to events for years, hey, Mayren, and uh, I I am so sad because he had written such a sweet song for her, and all I remember is is one line of it. And by the time I I thought to try to catch the song from him, he had <laughs> forgotten it and couldn't sing it. Um, so, you know, word fame to um, catching the songs. Uh, before they disappear, uh, even out of the author. Um, but anyways, so I wanted to say May Ren. I wanted to say that um, few were the events that that uh, I didn't ask him to sing Star of the County Down because uh, that's just the one that really resonates with me from Lucas. And then <laughs> the most memorable bardic performance I have ever seen him do is uh, he was Duke Michael's Herald and so in court, uh, he began doing a running, uh, a running, oh, let's just call it what it was, a running gag. Uh, he had appeared in court dressed as a woman, as his own cousin, Lucasia, um, right? And was talking about the fact that he had been kidnapped or she had been kidnapped by the Visigoths and had come to try to collect her own ransom. And for the entire summer, there would be uh, installments where Lucas would read a letter from his cousin um, who was being held by the Visigoths. And I, like everyone in court was laughing so hard that we were crying. It was. Uh, it was, it was. It was, it was, it was, like... <laughs> it was just a splendid summer. Put your pants up. <laughs> it was great. Um, he, was, he had us reduced to tears. It was so funny. So, so that is possibly one of the more memorable performances, not in a bardic competition, but uh, but in court. Rhiannon, well, thank just, you for that memory because I had forgotten. God bless you. <laughs> Lucasia is 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 memorable and deserves to be. Yeah, Lucasia remembers <laughs> to be preserved and and ransomed from the Visigoths. Well, that that kind of brings it back to my point that I harp about. Um, when Locas discovered that he had cancer, um, he and I had been corresponding every four or five months. Hey, I'd really love to build your wiki page. Yeah, yeah, we should do that sometime. And I had someone who was literally driving the paperwork down to Locas to get his signature on the permission forms the day before he passed away. Mm. And he did not have the strength to sign them. Um. Hmm. I'm going to try not to get emotional. Oh. Don't let your stories be lost. Thank you. That's the point. Uh, I worked with this man on and off for three years, trying to find an opportunity to meet, trying to get him to write down the songs that he had sung and to tell me about his history with the SCA and him as a person and him as a performer. And we were never able to connect and it's too late now. And there's hundreds and hundreds of people who have affected on Stior's history over the years that um, I will never have that opportunity to document. And it breaks my heart, uh, even though, you know, it's, it's beyond the power of someone who isn't a medium, um, but I still feel it as a weight. So don't make me chase you down. <laughs> Tell me your stories uh, and, and let me capture that because the person who hears about this, who never got to meet Lucas, has no place to go to learn about him. And that's what the wiki can be. It can be a place to record the stories, literally record them in audio. We, we've got uh, one of the coolest files that I have on the wiki is an audio file of the peerage <laughs> elevation of a lady from Moonshadow and all of Moonshadow is walking into court, singing her way into the court. And it's just beautiful. 
um, sorry, uh, I get uh, I get passionate about these things. But we can do audio files, and we can do links to YouTube, and we can we can scan music sheets. I'm blanking on the name of what they're actually called when they have the musical notations, but those things that you guys know what I'm talking about. It, it's it's such a tool. There are 27 boxes in Southern Texas in which the historian's office documents are molding. Mm -hmm. They do no one any good molding in a box. But the electronic records get backed up by Amazon every single night. They are going nowhere. They are preserved forever. And yet, how do you capture the case? You, you capture the case by people telling stories and people sending in the photographs and people at a fireside telling me stories about him because I walk around with a digital recorder I at know. every event I go I to. I know, Zubeda. And it's I the agree. best I can do. It's I agree with what you do and I agree with how do you capture the case. <laughs> yeah, really. But, but I couldn't. And I never got his signature. I can't build a page about him. It's not even a page. It's how do you capture that essence? There's a heart connection there that goes beyond words. But yeah, agreed. So thank you to Robin of Gilwell. I have been getting notifications on my phone as he has been sending me files. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I will stay up late tonight and they will be added before I sleep. I promise you that. One of those is Captain's piece. It's not doesn't go on my page, and you need his permission. Fair enough. I will hunt it down. It's the chanson. I would like to um, invite the bards here to contact me at if you want to contact me for conversation or stories. Um, I'm really in busy through June, but as time permits, I would love to have conversation with my fellow bards and share what I know and learn what you love and hear your stories and share my stories and stories of those that I love. So if you care to do that, you are welcome. So if y'all don't mind, I would like to mention some people and we dropped a few names. Uh, Robin was talking about Cadman and uh, he was a marvelous bar. Oh, yes. Um, and we had some some right. women that were such amazing singers. One yep. of them was du Duchess Saglinda Sear. Absolutely. Um, and we had uh, Baroness Rosalind Angleteer from up in your neck of the woods and uh, nor um, where North, we are? Keep. North North Keep. There you go. And Sir Finn Kelly. Oh, I And uh, if you know. Campsite, you could hear him all over. He was wonderful. Aurelian Rigel. Yes. Ragnar. Yes. Moonwolf. Yes. Uh, Leon Dunn. Arm. Arm. Hossein Ali Gomi. Hossein Ali Gomi. Ray Geertsen. You're damn right. He was my, he was my uh, personal bard during my uh, fifth and sixth reign, both of them. And uh, the man was awesome. Uh, but you, you guys uh, are, are following a very strong and, and very talented uh, group of people. Uh, you're probably up to it, I hope so. And Branwen, with her recorder, and Mr. Savon with a heart. I have her paintings. Yes. Yeah. Of course, uh, Savon plays professionally she's a serious harper harpist whatever uh -huh. you call it. serious <laughs> but uh, yeah we, harpist, yes yeah she's uh plays with symphony orchestras and stuff one of my favorite and i'm forget i'm forgetting people sir sir harold bodvars sir harold bodvars and Scald second theory of audubon stella who sir harold Sir Harold Bovers, Scaldic poetry, man, or Nor Norse poetry. I stay in touch with him a little bit. If it's the person I'm thinking about, he's in Mamron, Oklahoma. 
Norman, Oklahoma. No, Harold is in uh, Atlantia. Okay, not the same person. This was, this was Sir Harold. He was a knight before. He okay, was no, this person's not a knight. Um, but I, you know, I think it's great that the tradition continues. And uh, you guys are so enthusiastic about keeping it going. It's really great. So I've dropped all my names now. Finn, did and you have more. one that you wanted to name? Sir Finn, Sir Finn Kelly O'Donnell. I remember very vividly uh, one of Crepin's courts was running really late. And the autocrats were begging bards to take the stage to entertain the crown in the meantime. And for whatever reason, uh, Duchess Rowan had shown up for that event and got up on stage and was juggling to entertain the crowd. I mean, how often do you see something like that? It almost never happens anymore. So, well, I'll tell but it you, was one of my was... great. It was just something that stuck in. It will be for with me forever. Well, remember this: it, if a king to ask a knight to get up and perform, he better, by God, get up and perform. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> the three qualities. And, and Sir Rowan, by she got up and performed, mm -hmm. and I've heard some of the worst and some of the best from our knights because in Nostiora you're not just a knuckle dragon stick jock you better be a gentleman and you better be able to entertain so one of the folks that was here earlier I don't know if you guys have had a chance to hear Elspeth perform yeah, um, she but she's a relative newcomer to the SCA she's been in for less than six years mm -hmm. um, but Oh my lord, that woman has an amazing voice. Um, I, I refer to her as the Meadowlark of the North because she has such an exquisite voice and she's very good at composition on the spur of the moment. Uh, I've watched two competitions in which she was challenged to write something in the next hour and perform it at court. I and, love her song about her home group of Wildwood. Oh, I haven't heard that. Yeah. Uh, I'm We've going. talked about doing some stuff together and just can't get an event together to do it. But I love her. <laughs> I'm going to interject and add word fame to that because I first met her um, during the very SF photo where I I won <laughs> the premier bar the premier bar title um, as the first time I got to hear her perform and uh, it was so captivating <laughs> that when we were asked to that the crown asked me to put together. Um, bardic performances for court um i made a very I, I made a decision in the moment that i wasn't going to do it that i wanted to make sure we highlighted bards from across the realm and she was like number one or two on my list where i was like you people need to hear you perform because she's a phenomenal performer and adding another subtle word fame plug-in um in this bardic war she was uh, on sarah's pick for the um blind face voice competition that we had and our alliance won that point. So I firmly believe that she okay. has something to do with that. Um, yeah. I, I do want to say too, now that I've commanded the field a bit, <laughs> um, first of all, Zubeda, thank you for putting these together. Um, these chats are such a resource. Um, I know I don't always come to them, but I do watch them because for me, they're a very useful way to learn about the history of the kingdom. From people that I, if we're being honest, I might not have seen very often because I can't travel around. And even pre-pandemic, you know, it's hard to always be at every event to see everybody. So I want to thank you for everything you do as far as how tirelessly work to, to put this together. And I got to say, it's, it's so enlightening to hear so many people talk about bards that should be remembered. <laughs> because as a relative newcomer, who mostly interacts with other relative newcomers, the way that you all talk about bars <coughs> and inspire you is actually the way we talk about you all. <laughs> is actually the way, and I mean, exactly like, mm -hmm. like, like I, I mean, I have been in multiple circles pre-pandemic and during pandemic where we have talked about, you know, like, oh, like 
there's this one piece that I heard and I don't remember it. Oh, Master, Master Alden knows that song. You got to ask Mr. Alden about that song. Or, or, oh, have you, have you heard, have you heard Kanadi Finn perform? Have you ever heard him perform Skaldic verse in, in non-English? Like, have you ever seen anything like that? Like, the way you all talk about yourselves, about bards that inspire you, is very much the way we talk about the people in this circle. And it's so interesting to kind of be part of those two worlds and to see that kind of thing. You know, we ask how these memories get preserved. It's literally the point of the bardic tradition. It's literally the point of being a bard is preserving and keeping these traditions alive. So, to the torchbearers. Um, Case that cut off. To the torchbearers. I have said on more than one occasion, the only thing I ever want out of the SCA is for someone to remember me the way Ivar Runamagi remembers Ragnar Ulfgarsson. That's it. <laughs> That's all I want. One you person. don't want much. And Just and one. You already have somebody who's, who thinks that way about you because I've talked to her about it you inspired a bard who was absolutely terrified to go on stage and she did so because of your example and she was your standard bearer when you were elevated to the peerage so you know who i'm talking about i love her so much um but yes you have people who think of you that way and yeah you absolutely inspire people and and uh and i have reached out to ragnar's widow by the way to try and get permission to capture his works and preserve them because his domain is going to go away at some point. Mm -hmm. It's not being maintained. It, that, it's that, already gone. I, it I will always live on. on. It may live on, not live on in these middle ages, but I have every work that Ragnar gave to us, is which is tradition. all his this work. This is my most But I do not have permission to, the to share them. And it is, it's Ragnar's belt. Uh, the significance that belts are given in our society um, makes this, you know, extra special. But I had I had written a, a skaldic verse to commemorate Ragnar and had planned on performing it and giving and I had my wife uh, draw up a scroll for it and everything, and we were going to give it to the longship company. And um, Thorties showed up to the event. And it was the first time she'd been out in a long, long time. And she, nobody knew that I was writing the poem. It was going to be, it was a complete surprise. I didn't tell anybody. But for some reason, so she told me that day that when she got up something told her she needed to grab the belt and take it to the event it hasn't been out of the closet or worn since ragnar passed but some for some reason she knew to bring it and when i performed the poem for him she came up to me afterwards and presented me the belt and asked me to to take care of it and carry on the skaldic tradition so I believe I was there when that happened. It is it is absolutely my most prized possession. Yeah. Think of our battle scald and Orm were there too. So here's a question. I'm I'm the daughter of a genealogist. It's why I got involved with being a historian. <laughs> you poor child. Uh I, I grew up running through graveyards and doing rubbings and looking through old pictures and and something that my mom impressed on me was do you consider that your possession or do you consider yourself its caretaker? It's, that's an interesting question. To be honest, uh, a little bit of both. Um, what, what I told authorities is that I will, I will wear it and, and I will wear it to carry on the tradition, but I will also carry it in a fashion that I will always be looking for someone eventually to take up that mantle sometime down the road, there will need to be another skald come up in the kingdom that 
that needs to take it on after me. And he'll get the, you know, and it'll be a lineage that, that gets passed down. You know, this belt was crafted by Ragnar's own hand, presented to me by his wife after he passed. Now I'm passing it to you. And hopefully that will be something that lives on long after I'm gone. Okay, so something just jumped into my head. I know that there is a Harold's Pelican Medallion that gets passed down from um, Harold to Harold that is made a pelican. Is there anything like that for the bards in the no, floral circle? No, 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 no. Okay, darn, because that would be um, cool. The people it could who happen now. That hate is long gone. You think so, Robin? Do you think so? I think I'm a Laurel. I'm also a Laurel. As am I. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, we tried real hard to change that way of thinking. You did. You did. We but tried really hard. It sounds yeah. like you succeeded, given the number of Laurels that we have right here. Make your own badge. Do it. There's nothing to stop you. When I was up and coming um, as a performer and uh, as part of the yeah. arts and sciences community, uh, mm. I, I, I met with laurels and I, I said, the feeling I have is that bardic arts are the redheaded stepchild of a and uh -huh. How can we change that? Um, the question and, should have been, how can you change that? Not how can we change that? Well, Speaking, speaking as the bards, uh, you, you know, I can only do what I can do. Um, but I, but I, I, I made that kind of a, a, a mission, a goal for myself. Um, and, and largely the, the feedback that I got and what I tried to promote was the laurels are not going to come watch us perform. No, we, they're not. We need to go to where the laurels are and show them what we're doing. Um, and that's what I did. Whenever there was an ANS an competition, I said, are performance pieces allowed in the ANS competition? Because performance ANS is, is, a, is a bit of a different beastie than Bardic. Um, and I wanted to show the Laurels that I could play their game as a performance artist. I could meet their requirements and their standards by their judging sheets. Um, in addition to going off and, and performing Bardic in a Bardic circle um, or, or different, that have a different judging. And that's a really good move. Business. Yes, it is. And, and, and I did that and I, and I fought hard in doing that. And it was very satisfying to me when um, the Isethod that Master Brian O'William won, uh, he and I were in the finals together and they called us both up uh, into court together and announced both of us together that we were, uh, they were going to recognize us as laurels. Um, and it was the best second place I ever won. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta love it. I really do. That, yeah. That Ice that Thetford was the most amazing kingdom bardic performance from top to bottom i have ever seen so sorry uh, to have were, missed it there were over a dozen entrants and everybody brought their a game it was and amazing which event was this uh it was steps 12th night in 2016 so, uh, so yeah, I, I gave up on Steph Self Knot. I have gone was, to so many twelve. Like I said, it was I remember it vividly because I had had major surgery just a few months before. But I was determined I was gonna make that I Steadford and compete. And Gosh. it was one of the dumbest moves i have ever done i shouldn't have been there to do that i shouldn't have i was just too stubborn to let it go uh i had missed the previous two years of ice deadfords because i'd been sick 
and I wasn't going to miss a third year if I could help it. But so and, glad that it was such a neat event. And I was, I was still on pain meds. <laughs> Ouch. And I was, but I was, I couldn't take the pain meds because then I couldn't think of the material. I couldn't remember the words. So I just, I like suffered through the whole day. And I, and I honestly would not have made it through the day if it hadn't been for Rosa. Um, who, who despite her also taking time and doing her performances between rounds, she helped work on, on my shoulders and my pain issues, uh, to help me get through. And I will never, ever forget you for that. Thank you. You should write that up as word fame and send it to me for a page. <laughs> you so know, something, something else that I wanted to add on real quick. Alden mentioned the difference between, you know, Bardic in the community versus Bardic in A&S. And one of the things that I try I to tell yeah. up and coming performers that are trying to figure out where they fit in to the Bardic community is there's, there's really three distinct areas and and they can have some overlap but you really need to pay attention to which one that you're focusing on at the time you have your bardic by firelight campside bardic circles you have your ans uh, documented performances and then you also have the competitions and they are three very different entities. And the goal for each of them is very different. Um, your, your Fireside Bardic, you're going to get tons of great filk and funny stories and, you know, grand adventures. And, and nothing has to fit in any rhyme or reason. It just has to be fun and entertaining. Um your your competitions you really only want to step into that if you're bringing something that is a solid performance that you've practiced and you're ready to perform and and showcase your ans entry that is a whole nother level you've got to have documentation and you've got to do the performance you know a certain way everything is is very very much rigid and structured in, in a certain way if you're if you're going to do that, but but there's no reason why you can't do all three. You just have to be aware that what you're doing for Fireside won't necessarily work for ANS or a competition. They're just they're very different. Now they and, are, but at one time that was not so. And the flow between the different types of events and different types of performances was very similar, except that I'll say that the late night fireside was much as you say, it, it kind of devolved into, you know, silly, funny stuff. But um, at one time, the flow between being a performer in one venue or another or another was very, very similar. When I won the... Um, Premier Lion, the Bardic, the Premier Bard of the Lions of Anstiora, I had no idea I was competing. I got up and I performed and I said, hear me thus. And so it was in the time of my people. And I have fled from my country, but though um, you hear this, know that they are in flames. And I, you know, did my thing. Okay. And it was, it was, a commanding the field kind of thing. And it was no idea I was performing for somebody that was, I had no idea that, that there was a, a competition on. <laughs> and at the end of it, um, Jan and his Baroness walked up to me and presented this cords that were specifically chosen for me with the, out of all the gifts that they had, had given to them to present to somebody. 
of white and red checky and not one person there except the Celts knew what that meant to me. <laughs> and okay. that too has been lost. What does that mean? Um, the red and white checky is a really sign of esteem in the Celtic world, okay? Because it's rich colors and the dyes are expensive and not many people can afford them. Red is the cloak of bardom and of kingship and queenship in, uh, in um, Celtic. And I get that from a book called the Araset. A-R, I'll have to send it to you and you can post it. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Alden. Thank you, Alden. Right. Contact me sometime. I will. Thank you. And um, it, the, the book actually is really interesting because it goes into all this um, detail about the um, sumptuary laws of Ireland at a certain period in time, which is not my period, but it works for, you know, some things. And um, it's written in Old Irish, Modern Irish, Latin, and English, and it's wonderful. Oh, wow. So I've gotten it from my library on interlibrary loan. Mm. Nice. <laughs> it's also available online. So it might be available online by now. Who knows? Orm thinks it might be. But anyway, um, it, was, it was a wonderful experience because I had no idea I was competing for something. And it was all flow of the moment. You stepped in, you did something, you backed out. Somebody else stepped in, they did something, they backed out. And it went on for days not minutes, not a, a stupid feast, excuse me, but days like that. And the people who won at the end of the day were the people who had commanded the most moments during the day in the eyes of those who were putting on the event. And court was never out of session, but the idea of court being um, brought to court, and we're all in court now, and we're all not in court now, was never a thing then. The king is in presence. We are always in court. And you behaved accordingly. And the bards behaved accordingly. And the artisans behaved accordingly. And the fighters behaved accordingly. accordingly. And it was more awesome than I can describe. <laughs> really, it is. Because um, it was a flow of events. And it was a flow of continuity between some things that worked and some things that didn't. And we were all kind of trying to present our, our best selves at the time and in persona. And part of that persona might have been bardcraft or fighter or blacksmith or um, gate guard or whatever. And it was all so valuable and so much a part of everybody else's story. And I don't know how to convey how big that was. Well, thank you for the attempt and thank you for sharing your <laughs> memories with us. Um, I am, however, starting to get scolding looks from my spouse who is reminding me that I have to get up very early tomorrow. So uh, I would give the last opportunity to speak to our premier bard if you had something you wanted to add. Sure. Um, gosh, I have so many feelings to add. As I'm sure everyone here, you know, get a bunch of bards in a circle and tell them to stop talking for, you know, <laughs> <laughs> talk about running the meter. Um, I want to kind of finish on the final thoughts and some of, some of the thoughts I've been shared about culture changing. Um, and not in the negative way that most people think, because usually when we talk about culture changing, people usually have like a very gut punch reaction as far as like, oh, I don't want things to change. No, um, I wanna say that I, I, I myself here today am definitive proof about the positive changes that are starting to happen within the Bardic community. Um, and I can tell you that for many reasons because you know I don't know how it was back in the day, but my entire time in the SCA, the, the couple of years or so that I've been here, um, I have got to see most all the bards that I respect either already be laurels or become laurels <laughs> in my time here. And so by proxy, I suddenly have so many laurel bards <laughs> to consult and talk to, which is, you know, it's to me, it's tragic that, that wasn't how that always was because that's a pleasure and a privilege that I get to have today. I 
I don't tell the story um, to people publicly. And the fact that it's going to be recorded is a little uncomfortable. Uh, I think... Just give me a moment and I will. No, no, no. I, I want it to be recorded. I think I think it's it's fair to have it recorded. Okay. Um, because it gets to also share a little bit of war fame with someone that I don't work fame publicly a lot because he doesn't like it. Um, <laughs> I uh, The weeks before, my the, the SF where I won the title, uh, I was seriously thinking about leaving the society. Um, I had been struggling with a lot of personal stuff and feeling frustrated that people uh, were not as receptive to me bringing in new culture into the SCA that was not necessarily Euros European per se. I felt frustrated that a lot of the Bardic events I'd been to were, as, as Finn described, whole different beasts and were not exactly about community raising. And we're more about, if we're being honest, pitting bards against each other in very ugly and nasty ways when we should be working together as a community. And I was very frustrated by a lot of that. And as I said, my partner um, had begun to leave and, and was disinterested in society work because of some of the, of the personal stuff he'd seen within his own communities. Um, and I will not speak to that because that is his story, not mine. But uh, the last event before Stafford uh, was Twelfth Night, <laughs> and before I could leave in an emotional huff over some things that happened that day, uh, Lady Kara pulled me aside <laughs> and said, hold on, um, people need to talk to you. We need to talk to you. And she gathered several laurels, um, including one of them who is here. <laughs> so, you know, Karate Finn, she, she gathered several of them, and the words they shared with me that night were the things that made me want to stay. They're the things that made me want to keep playing this game and doing the things that I do. I'm sorry, I'm being corrected. It was Count of Us, not Twelfth Night. <laughs> this is what happens when you try to remember a, a million stories all at once. Uh, but yeah, so it was Count of Us. It wasn't Twelfth Night. But yeah, so it was Count of Us where this happened. Um, but yeah, so the words that were shared with me the encouragement that all these people uh, gave me that directly came from their own struggles in their time trying to carve their own path to society, it gave me the strength and encouragement to do my own path. And when I won that competition, when I went into that staff, I decided to hell with trying to make everyone happy I'm here to do the thing that I want to do. I'm here to tell the stories and to share the culture and to share the art that I want to share. And the praise that I receive, people that to this day, <laughs> when they see me virtually and they will say to me like, oh, that performance that you gave, like it was so meaningful. I have, I have people that still uh, ask me to sing a particular song because it means a lot to them because, because I shared it in the final round and it was a song in an indigenous language that nobody understands. <laughs> and yet to see the whole audience resonate with it. I mean, that is the, that is the power that Bardic Arts have for how it can grow. Mm -hmm. And I would not have, I would not have the courage and tenacity and decided to do that if um, multiple people, honestly, <laughs> had given it to me, given, given me that uh, encouragement that one in particular who is here, who I don't give him enough praise for it. So thank you, Gennady Finn. So let's all come at you. Thank you. Well, if there's something worth having, you got to fight for it. Yeah. And uh, having Bardic and having Bardic laurels was a fight that we took on and we we won. But to have it, you got to fight to keep it. Now, there's ways of fighting and you're doing fine. So uh, don't ever, ever lose heart, guys, ever. Because as black as it may be today, it's going to be sunny tomorrow. As long as you keep on telling your stories and singing your songs and enjoying 
the part of the SCA that you love. That's all you can do. That's all any of us ever did. Look at that big grin on Megan's face. She knows. It's all you can do is just hang in, be tough, and just keep creating fun for yourself and for the people around you. That's all it is. And uh, you're welcome, dude. Um, Tenoch, if you ever get the chance to come up to a Moonshadow event, mm. um, I think that you would enjoy it. A lot of their culture is about song. And um, they have a evening dishwashing party in which all of the guys strip off their shirts. Everyone is considered glorious and awesome. And they sing as they're washing the dishes. And it is, right. it is a Tenoch, cultural I'll, tradition. I'll drive you up there the next time I go if you're interested. It is it is a thing to behold. <laughs> Naked dishwasher. I will take you all up on that. Very if much. any of you come to the north, starting again, if any of you come to the north, let me know. I will hope to be there. Well, North Cape Castellan is coming up June twenty fifth. <clears throat> oh God, I've got I'm teaching so many classes this in yeah. June. It's it's already sold out at this point. Yeah, forgive, um, but the only way I would come is as a um, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I will not be there. But things are opening back up and and hopefully there will be more uh, opportunities for folks to meet in person and I hope. the blending of voices will be heard again and it will just be a wonderful and glorious my, thing. My hope yeah. that uh, we can, uh, Robin, Carrot and I can uh, travel around the kingdom and meet with groups or individuals that are wanting to uh, either reactivate their uh, performance art culture or uh, get it started. And uh, we want to work with them on knowing that they have resources within the kingdom, encouraging them to you know, scour the Wikipedia page for their stories to share, uh, to submit their stories, but you know how to have it. There's so many places that have great opportunities. So even though we are limited on our events, there may be opportunities for people to get together at a non-event level. Uh, and that is uh, hopefully will start happening. We're just wanting to make sure we play within the rules. And uh, but I've talked to Robin Carrot since he's working with the music. And uh, I'm working with all the other performers <laughs> uh, that, uh, you know, we we kind of enjoyed that because I know Stargate has a great system going. Um, not sure what steps has got going but uh you know reaching out and finding out what everybody's doing i am really grateful to have met rosa and tinoff and Ra uh, robin carrot this tonight because i didn't know you guys awesome stuff that you're doing we have not been traveling because we're really busy launching second a uh, third careers and um orm is immersed in his art and i am a professional herbalist and um the big tent that was one of the tents that kind of got referred to today is gone. This tent lasted for 50 years. It started before the SCA in our area and lasted until 10 years, eight years ago, and it gave out. It just fragmented. It was a 12 person um, wall tent and it held the entire um, longship company at one point. It held the entire um, Gosh, I forget how many households at different points. And another story, but anyway, it's gone, which means that we would love to camp out, but we don't have a place to camp out anymore. So we're gonna have to do that. And as that happens, thank you, Finn. As that happens, we'll be back at times in our best ability, okay? Wonderful. But, um, our big thing was we used to travel and teach persona, and we will still do that. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so very, very much for joining me tonight. This has been a wonderful conversation. I've learned so much about our bardic history, and I would uh, encourage all of you. In fact, I think, Megan, you are the only one left who doesn't have a wiki page. We've got to fix that. Oh, dear. Um, Tenox is going up uh, the next day or so. 
Um, make, make sure to get it in the nick of time because I didn't want that. I didn't want to be attacked. I was already attacked by about it so many times this week. Well, I, I was. Wanna... I wouldn't attack. I would simply, you know, gently and persistently encourage. I sent you a message, Zubeda. Uh, Gary came and visited me personally, so thank you because I couldn't get him out of Houston. I got him out of Houston. Uh, I have over four albums of his. He has asked me to scan. I have started with the SCA before the mound. I have pictures. I just need to get with you, but he's got his release to you. So um, I, I said, do I have a release? Uh, the, you just sent? the last time I posted pictures, it's the same guy. Okay. Uh, I will need your help kind of connecting those dots. Not a problem. Like I said, if you'll check the thread, the, the release is in the thread on the uh, messenger. Okay. So, uh, but yeah, like I said, there's a message for you. Just check it. And uh, again, thank you again. You have no idea how doing that helped him because he didn't realize he was helping other people. Who was it? Wonderful. Uh, Gordon Redwolf. Don't, don't know Gordon Redwolf. He's uh, down from Sea Winds. He was one of the, the members that started Sea Winds. Um, always a good dresser. He, he always, maybe not the best fighter, but he always looked good what on What year? Him. What year? Um, late mid eighties. Ah, didn't know. I remember. I remember yeah. him. Yeah. I don't remember him. Yeah. I do. I we remember. have he stuff dating from the early seventies, mm -hmm. but you know, it's in an attic. It needs to be parsed, and some of it is awful history. It's not nice, and mm -hmm. I don't know how much it, it's. It doesn't represent you know anybody who's now in the SCA poorly, but those early days had some rough rough moments. Well, and, we need um, to go back to bed before her husband gets the better part of her. So, <laughs> but uh, but thank you. That's funny. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I sh I'm sure we need to let you go. Thank you so much. You all have a good evening. Thank you so thank much. You. Guys, thank you.